International Master Teddy Coleman taking on International Master Lars Oscar Haug in the I'm Not a GM Speed Chess Championship. Hope you're enjoying your weekend, having a good day, ready for some exciting chess because we have that in store for you. And just a reminder to everybody, you may be new here, but you are perfectly welcome. It, this is the format. It is a single elimination knockout. We started with 16 players. Now we're into the quarterfinals. Each match has the time patrols you see in front of you. 75 minutes of the longest time patrol of five minute plus one second increment blitz. We get 45 minutes of the three plus one. Finally get 25 minutes of everybody's favorite time patrol, bullet chess. And the winner moves on. The loser, well, they take their prize money and they call it a fun tournament. And that prize money you see right in front of you here. We're in the quarterfinal stage. So the winner gets $300 and moves on. The the rest of the prize on $300 is split by win percentage. So every single game counts in this format. You don't want to take a game off because that could cost you some prize money. And let's look at the overall bracket. Remind everybody how we got here, where we're going. You see that we are in the uh, bottom right of our bracket here. Teddy Coleman, Lars Oscar Haug. Lars beat the 2020 runner-up, Alina Keshlinskaya, in a very topsy-turvy day. It was looking good for Alina at some points. Then Lars, he put up great defense. He was bending but not breaking, and he was able to win by the score 15-9. And for Teddy Coleman against Carissa Yip, that was our closest match of the first round. He wins by a single point. There were plenty of games where it looked like Carissa had the upper hand. Teddy fought back valiantly, and he was able to win some games in mutual time trouble and thus move on to the quarterfinals. So we have Teddy. We have Lars Oscar here. It's going to be a great matchup indeed of two very strong players, different styles. And we'll see if they'll be able to fix the mistakes they made in their first matches, where Lars, some of his openings did not go his way. That's what he said in the post-match interview. He was talking about it, saying, oh, I got to work on my openings because Alina was just giving me problems in every single which way. And for Teddy, his openings looked very strong, but there were times where it felt like he lost the thread of the position. Sometimes the tactics were there. He played something that was slightly wrong, and he was able to come back within the match, but it gave Carissa many opportunities and she did have so many good positions. And well, this match is about to begin. We want to remind you of an upcoming match as well, because I know a lot of you are looking forward to that one. That will be international master Levy Rosman, better known as Gotham Chess to many of you out there. And international master Eric Rosen, known as I am Rosen, pretty straightforward. And that will be Tuesday, February 9th, 6 p.m. Pacific time. That's 9 p.m. on the East coast here and well if you're in europe that's pretty late so i don't know if you're going to be staying up for that or early in the morning i should say but that will be a great finish to our quarterfinals here in the i'm not gm speed chess championship so we have just a few minutes until the match begins we, i just saw you missed it because we <laughs> put him back on camera a second too late there lars oscar was stretching he's getting ready for this intense matchup it is intense. These players, they stress. We saw Teddy in match one. He was there just fidgeting throughout the whole way. And we'll see if he can calm his nerves and play a good match against Lars because Lars is here to play. He is one of the highest rated players in terms of FIDE rating in the entire field. And if he can fix his opening woes, that will give his chances a much bigger boost than uh, you know we have seen in previous matches. So Lars, he knows his work is cut out for him. Teddy is the underdog in this match. He knows what he needs to fix. And now it's about putting all that hard work onto the chessboard. So just a minute away, looking forward to this match beginning here. And I don't know what else to say. I kind of want their play to do the talking. I speak a lot. I've done many of these shows. But at the end of the day, it's what the players bring. And for Teddy, for Lars Oscar here, we are going to see if they have brought their best stuff on this Sunday. And I see you all. Welcome, everybody. If you're new, this is the I'm Not GM Speed Chess Championship. And if you're returning, you know exactly what this is. You don't need me to inform you of what we're doing here. And we have liftoff. We do have moves here. Teddy gets the white pieces in game one. You look at their blitz ratings. It is not that big of a difference. 40 rating points. That's pretty close. We see D4 and C4 by Teddy. And look at that. A strike with C5. And we get a Banco Gambit. So in Lars' style, 
he's sacrificing a pawn to open up the state of the board. And you'll see that there's this tension on a6 and b5, neither side flinching just yet, because if you take on a6, that allows Black's piece to take right back in one turn. But by playing a4, knight c3, bishop f1, you know that this b5 pawn is well defended. So if it's captured, you can capture right back and probably with the bishop. So you get to develop in one turn. It's a good lesson in tension here. And d6, knight f3, Teddy playing this very quickly. And the b5 capture, still, bishop takes b5. So if you are going to take on b5, you might want to wait until this bishop makes a move. Because if I play bishop e2 and then have to take, well, black gets a move in the process. So for Lars, you have to figure out what that move should be. Are you going to put your bishop on g4 and pin the knight? Are you going to play with rook e8 and try to play for e6? And said Lars plays bishop to b7, which stares into a brick wall. We see these pawn chain here limiting the scope of that bishop, but a timely e6 can break the board open and that bishop can actually thrive when uh, that move is played. So bishop e2 played by Teddy. Now I expect this capture to happen because the bishop had to stop and then would capture. So it costs quite a tempo, but what would still be a pawn ahead. And of course, we mentioned this move E6. We should point out every single turn that is a possibility that Lars goes for. But the problem with playing E6 is if you capture and you capture back, at some point, a knight G5 type of move will put pressure on this pawn on E6. And Teddy says, yeah, to heck with that. Your bishop on B7 will not be a strong piece. I'm not taking on E6. If you take me, I take back. Your bishop is staring into my pawn, which is well defended by this knight on C3. So that is the theme of this position thus far. For Lars, he wants to develop his knight. Can't do that. You drop e6 and then d6. So if he is going to develop the knight, it's going to only be after he settles the tension in the center. He brings his knight to a6 rather than to d7. I guess there's this b4 square. Pretty juicy one for that knight. And once it gets to b4, that d5 pawn is under attack a third time. With three minor pieces going right after that pawn. So we see here that Teddy is sitting and thinking. The knight can also retreat to c7, but that's a less aggressive play. So it does attack the bishop, it does attack the pawn, but the bishop can slide back to c4 to defend this pawn on d5, which is why knight b4 seems to accomplish more. And right now, Teddy smartly trying to figure out, do I develop my bishop out to a square like f4 here, go after this d6 pawn? Do I put my bishop to g5, pinning your knight to the queen? But do I really want to take your knight with my bishop? I don't think so. This bishop on g7 is a very powerful piece. And so if you have to capture on f6 and say the queen captures back, that's a really nice diagonal for the queen and bishop to be in line on. So if h6 is played, I think Teddy will more likely drop the bishop back to a square like g3 rather than trading on f6. And knight b4 right after this pawn, but can you take it? The answer for now is no because of this pin. So let's say I make a move like rook to b1 and you try to take, I take you take and I can take on f6 and your queen is under attack. And so you actually can get away with this just for the moment because you can take my knight on f3, but that's the kind of tactic that Lars has to be careful for is that this pawn d5, you want to capture it so badly, but it could actually cost you some material. So queen d2, setting this exact thing up here is now if you take, I can take back. And once you try to take on f3, guess what? There's no queen on the d1 square. So this would actually cost black a full piece right away. So Lars will not be taking on d5. He also can't really play h6 because the queen and the bishop are lined up on that square. So typically against the Fianchetto, you want to try to trade off that bishop in front of the black king. And here, if you play h6, I steal a pawn in the process. So that could be a worthy trade of pawns. What do you mean by trade? Well, h6, you give up this h pawn and then you get this d5 pawn. And that could be nice for black, especially with this bishop on b7, but that's an important pawn in front of your king. So you have to be sure about that before you go ahead and play a move like h6. The bad news for black, you can't play rook to e8. The bishop covers that square. So this rook is sort of stuck in place for now. So what are we going to do? d5 can't be captured, at least not yet. Where's this rook going? Rook b8? No. Rook c8? No. Not really accomplishing all that much. So coming up with a good move here for black isn't that easy. Another move I'm thinking about is queen to a5. But if that queen comes to a5, you're neglecting the defense of this d6 pawn. It's same deal with queen to c8. One of the ideas I have here is can I take, take, and play knight to e4? coming after your bishop, coming after your pawn on d6, the bishop, sure, can drop to e7, but know what you've done? You've neglected your king safety. My queen can come into h6. So something like this could be what Teddy is eyeing in this position, giving up his bishop for a knight, but just trying to get after Black's pieces. So as we get back to the live board, we see Teddy over three minutes on the clock, Lars Oscar down to 222, lots of twos there, and he is trying to 
say, I need to play faster because I'm down the clock, but I also need to deal with the fact that I'm down a pawn here. And he is ready at long last to take this pawn on d5. His knight is no longer pinned to the queen on d8. The queen has moved out the way. So this pawn can be captured. And for Teddy, it's now about figuring this out. Do I really want to give up my bishop on f6? Well, with knight e4 coming next, I think that this is a good idea, but I can understand the hesitation. Why would I want to give up my piece here? This bishop could be very powerful. Maybe it's best coming back at some point to f4. This pawn on d6 is a target. If this knight moves out the way, maybe I'll get a bishop e7 if you're not careful. Do I want to play bishop c4 just to defend this pawn right away? I'm not in love with that move. Bishop to c4, it does make sense. It also vacates the b5 square for the knight to jump to to come after this d6 pawn. But I feel like Bishop takes f6. That's where I've set my mind uh, on. And right here, Teddy's trying to figure it out himself. So now he's down under two minutes. This is a, can be a problem when you're playing blitz chess. You think that, hey, it's a five-minute time control. I have all these minutes here to use. And now you're less time than your opponent. You're down 30-plus seconds. And you still haven't figured out a move in a complex position. So Teddy, looking at him here, he looks kind of just frozen. He's really trying to figure out the truth of this position. And Lars is moving nonstop, twirling his hair. He's trying to figure this out. I don't think he's happy about his position, but he should be happy about his clock. So Teddy does, in fact, take on f6, knight to e4, as I was calling for. And this pawn on d6 is a problem. Because if I can take that, I would be attacking your queen and your bishop. This is why Lars brings his queen back to defend the bishop and the pawn at the same time. A very good move by Lars because he had just put his queen on c8. Now he goes right back to d8 and says, hey, that's no worry. You traded off your bishop. And if you continue taking, once this queen takes here, d6 is not even under attack, but it's protected for good measure. The queen is lined up on this diagonal. And very importantly, this pawn on d5 is finally falling down unless you bring your bishop back to c4. So Teddy goes in queen h6. I expect a very quick bishop g7. I don't want this queen in here. Knight g5 is a deadly threat. So that's why the bishop comes back. And now knight takes d5. Queen takes d6 is Teddy's idea. You take my d pawn, I take yours. But this bishop on g7, it is super strong here. The pawn on b2 at the end of the diagonal will fall in many of these lines. So for Teddy, he's trying to figure this out. You know, Is that going to be a problem for me? For Lars, which pawn do I take? Do I take on d5? And which piece do I take with? Maybe I'll take with the bishop rather than the knight. The knight hits the queen, but we know that if the knight takes on d5, this pawn is still under threat. So perhaps the queen saves itself by stealing a pawn in the process. So Right now, Lars trying to figure this out. Bishop takes d5, knight takes d6 could be the play here. And then bishop takes b2, and it gets wild very fast. I feel like black's king is quite safe, and this pawn is valuable. But white does have this outside pawn protected by the bishop. This kind of configuration here, it's very annoying. As they protect one another, they are just stopping the rook's progress on the a-file. And later in the game, we can start thinking about pushing this pawn. But Lars goes for it. He takes the bishop on d5. Now the b2 pawn can be captured. So I would try to take that. He takes the knight on f3 first. I like that move because the queen needs to stay in line with the knight on d6. The queen would have preferred to take on f3, but you can't do that with the knight hanging. So Lars seeing the possibilities here. We do have the presence of opposite color bishops. The bishop on b5 remains powerful on this diagonal. It can also just go right back to c4 going for the f7 pawn. So despite the fact the white's pawn structure on the king side is worse. You have compromised structure with the double iced f pawns. This f7 pawn on a light square, that could be the biggest issue on the king side, believe it or not. And queen c7 lining up a pin. Let's get a rook to d8, a bishop to f8, and go after this pin piece. And I think that's something easy to miss. You may think rook a to d8 is coming because you're bringing your rooks towards the center. But in fact, rook f to d8 would have allowed bishop to f8, and this knight would have been in trouble. But now with queen to g3, that's a defended square. The knight is free to move, say to e4 or c4, wherever it is safe after black attacks the piece. So rook to d8, just knight to e4. And that's why Lars took this pawn on b2. Teddy says, okay, defending my knight on d6, my queen is free to go, and I have an open line. And I will bring my next rook to the second open line, and that way I can try to take control of the board. So Lars brings his a rook to d8, keeping an eye on the f7 pawn. But you know what? This pawn later in the game, that rook is gone, so this pawn can start thinking about pushing. Not yet. The queen covers the square, but Teddy first goes bishop c4. Watch out for the capture on f7. Lars says, all right, go for it. It's two pieces for 
a rook if you take on f7. That doesn't bother me. But Teddy does go for it, which surprises me here because now if the rook takes f7, there's no way to pile up on the pin piece. If he get his rook out quickly and attack, that would be good. But Lars can just play king to g7. Bishop takes f7, king takes back, and now it's two pieces for the rook. And this a pawn looks like it's in big trouble and probably just being captured. So if I'm Teddy, I'm thinking about sacrificing an exchange right back, maybe rook h4, and take this bishop. Because with the knight, and you would be an extra pawn for white. Like if you could play rook takes d4 now, there's also this nasty pin that's hard to get out of. So Teddy's pushing his pawn instead, hoping to trade off some pieces, but it looks like his king's in danger. I see the eval bar going in black's favor here. King e4, there's rook e3 checkmate. So the king had to drop back and look at this, attacking pawns and threatening forks. Knight e3 check, it's a fork. It wins the game for black. And I think Teddy will throw in the towel and he does. So Lars takes game one. He is up one game to none after one here. And Lars, he just... He's bopping. He's feeling the rhythm, and his pieces were doing the talking there. Teddy, he needs to strike back. It was a fine first game. We got tactical. He didn't handle some of that tension in the center uh, well at the key moments, but Lars saw every idea there. Bishop takes f3, pinning the knight, taking on b2, and Teddy took on f7, but it was his demise instead of black. So here we have game two underway. Black has the bishop pair. Black has the better pawn structure, you would think, because these are double pawns. But white plays in this manner, because once you play, say, b3, look at the clamp in the position. The d5 square is under white's control, and black considers sometimes play c6 and d5 himself. That way he can fight for space, because right now the pieces aren't doing all that much, and d5 is covered four different ways by white's pieces. So Teddy on the clock right now. Looking pretty calm. Lars and Teddy both trying to figure out the position here. Knight to d7. I really, really like this move. The knight can come to c5 with a tempo against the queen. But very importantly, you're giving yourself the option to play f5. Black has a light square bishop. White does not. So if I can play f5 and actually give this bishop some open space to work with, that is clearly to Black's benefit. And f5 is not weakening the king. Right now, it would drop a pawn, so I'm not suggesting it at the moment. But after castling, playing f5 makes a whole lot of sense. And here, White can think about casting queenside, but one of the good things that Teddy did with bringing the knight to d7 is he's bringing it towards the queenside, right? That knight can come to c5, for example. And after knight c5, you might have to take because otherwise your c4 pawn is not defended, right? Knight c5, your queen moves back. Well, actually, you can't even go to d2 because knight takes e4, and this pin is devastating against uh, White's queen here. So after knight c5, you'd have to take, and then I can just take back with my bishop and say, okay, I have the bishop pair against your knights, but it is a closed position. So in closed positions, the knights tend to reign supreme, and maybe you play f4 to open up the king side, something like that, but the bishop pair doesn't have the strength that you would prefer it to, and that would require an open board state. So bishop takes, knight takes c3. Interesting choice there by Teddy. I wonder if he felt like his bishop was going to get in trouble, if some kind of knight d5 was the move, and then the pawn would recapture if it was taken and the bishop was stranded out here. But I don't really like voluntarily giving up that bishop. It's opposite color bishops now. The pawn on c4 is defended. It's hard to attack that some more. Maybe some kind of a6, b5 is a way to just give up a pawn to open up the board. But Teddy said plays b6. So he's playing against the double pawn. He's cementing that pawn in place. No c5 for you. You're not getting this kind of sacrifice or break. And instead, Lars goes g4. But where is the attack going to come from? You can start pushing all your pawns up, and then black plays g6. You'd have to play h4, h5, g5, g6, something like that. But that also feels too time intensive. You're spending all of these moves pushing your pawns, and I don't think Teddy is going to just sit and say, hey, what's Lars doing by pushing the pawns? No, he's trying to attack and checkmate me. Not going to happen. So right now, Teddy has a choice to make here. What is he going for? Right now, he's solid. Black has no real weaknesses in the position, but you want to actually do something active here rather than just sitting and waiting. So he plays knight to c5. Great. That gets the piece active. Lars says, no, I'm not going to touch that knight. If I took on c5, the b pawn takes. Thank you for the open b file. No, no, no. So queen to e2. He could take on c5 at any moment. The knight's not really going anywhere. And this bishop on e6, it does stare into the pawn. But what else? Queen c8 to a6, perhaps that's an idea. We see Teddy go for it. The queen on a6 puts pressure on the c4 pawn, also stares down the a file. It scores like a3 and a2. And I said a3 first, because if the queen comes to a6, you might play b3. But then you have to look at the a3 squared. Not that it actually gets black in attack or much of anything, but that's where I keep my eye on is these kind of squares on the queen side. 
So V3 is likely to be in White's future, but it's not necessary just at this moment. And for Lars, well, what do I do? H4? He's giving up this pawn. And that's an interesting choice. He wants to play F3 and open up the G file. So if I'm Teddy, I'll be very nervous before I capture this pawn because bishop G4, pawn F3, and white's play next comes very obvious. Like bishop E6, or let's say bishop D7, something, rook to G1, bishop H6, and just this attack feels quite promising for white, especially in a blitz game. So I don't think that Teddy wants to grab that pawn, but he does so. He says, the material is important to me. I don't mind if I do. And I wonder if this bishop can even come to h5 so you can play f5 next and you defend actively by opening up lines for your pieces and by playing f5 in the future, your rook can come to f7 to defend this pawn. Your queen can go to d7 as well. So Teddy takes it. He plays bishop h5. He cannot drop his bishop to g6 because of pawn h5, but I think he's going to play pawn f5 here. And as mentioned, rook f7, queen d7, and everything's defended, but starts with king to h8 to not even allow bishop h6 to be played. So I, I understand this move. It makes perfect sense to me. No bishop h6. My pawn can capture it. It's no longer pinned to a king on g8. So what do you do here for Lars? How do you continue your attack? Do you play queen to g2, and then maybe rook to g8, and I just say, hey, I'm just going to bottle up here you're not making any progress remember that this queen it would like to go in but this pawn f3 is also under attack so the queen is doing an important job defending this pawn f3 at this moment and if not i think black does want to strike with f5 this knight can come to e6 which simultaneously defends the g7 pawn right that's a good defensive move but knights are tricky because they also can just hop forward as well from e6 into d4 f4 and if you can trade off this bishop your king starts to feel even safer so lars has quite a bit of extra time here. Teddy has been deliberate in his approach, but he has taken a pawn. So Teddy has the material. Lars has the potential attack and the extra time. But I like Black's position because I don't quite see the concrete attacking approach. And that can be very frustrating for a player. Rook to g5 does come to mind here as a way to attack this bishop. But I guess Teddy is just going to put his pawn on g6. And it's another reason he put his king on h8, just to stay out of the way. So if there's a, a sacrifice, you take back. Your rook takes over the g file first. And there's no quick checkmate because takes, takes bishop h6. If this king were on g8, your king is really in big danger. But because the king is in the corner, you have the g8 square for your rook to go to. So king h8 was a nice prophylactic move, anticipating what was going to happen. And that's why he Teddy says, I'm okay for now. It's reasonably safe. And f5 is still a defensive move that is aggressive. You play moves like this to clear the seventh rank, as I was highlighting earlier. And it gives you quick chances to play for an initiative against this pawn f3. So with knight e7, watch out, knight f6, knight e7. Both of these are moves after knight to d5. So you have to be careful about that. Queen e6 drops this pawn in c7. So the queen's doing an important task. So make queen d8. But then you have to think, what if the bishop replaces the rook on g5? That could be trouble for the black queen and the dark square. So Teddy says, ha ha. You want to get to f6? Not so fast. I am going to put my pawn in that square, protected by my rook, and doing something aggressive by attacking your rook on g5. This is a great move, f6. A very calm move in the middle of a very intense position. And this bishop on h6, it attacks the rook. Teddy says, okay, I'm going to bring my rook up. Where is your attack? g7? Got that covered. Maybe I'll play c6. But if you play c6, this queen can slide to g2, threatening bishop g7 check ideas. But this, this queen can come to g8. So c6 is probably a move here. It's risky. I get it. But this knight also can come back to e6. I forgot about that knight for now. And Teddy says, I don't even want to deal with it. Your knight is not actually threatening me at the moment. c6. Oh, let's go back a sec. c6 would have blundered the f6 pawn because if you take, there's a check on g7. It's clear that uh, this is, is not approved. Maybe just queen to e6 or something like that. And there's a problem with the pieces here. But knight takes f6 was probably a concern. And then having the knight on e6 does a good job of covering the g7 square. So black bringing the pieces back and now has more time. This is the problem with going for attacks that you don't actually see uh, the clear way forward is you start burning your own clock and then you have to justify the material sacrifice because black is up a rook and a pawn for this bishop. And I get it. The king is not perfectly safe in the corner, but you don't have anything as a clear follow-up and now you're the one spending all your time so teddy handles this very well he has extra time and queen to g2 i think intentions are pretty clear down the g file but guess what knight rook cover g7 no check for you 
queen and rook cover g8. So there's nothing there. And that's why Teddy plays queen and d7. Now his rook covers the last rank. His queen and rook cover the seventh rank. How are you going to checkmate this black king? So knight e3. Perhaps there's a knight f5. I get it. But now that g7 is covered, maybe knight f4 is a reasonable move. Maybe knight d4 is a play. And the g7 square is very, very important here. And it's just covered by too many of black's pieces at the moment. Four. So how can Teddy rearrange his pieces? His rook would love to be on a square like g6 or g8. Sadly, rooks are not queens. They can't move like that. But that's what you want is trade off a rook. And so he plays rook to e8 going to the e file. There's not much happening there, but he's allowed knight to f5. And now this g7 square, one, two, three, four. And Teddy says, all right, queen to c8. He changed the order of his pieces. This was actually quite brilliant, in fact. By playing rook, queen d7, rook e8, queen c8, he wants to put his rook on g8. And that was his idea from the beginning, but his queen was in the way. So he <laughs> switches the order of his heavy pieces, trying to trade off on the g file. So queen h3, I think knight d4 is a good move now. Just noting that this queen is at the end of the diagonal. Instead, we see a trade on g8. You can take with either piece. Bishop e3, threatening knight h6, that's a four against your queen and your rook. This knight is now not very well defended. Queen to g6, I'm already looking at ideas of knight to d6, for example, trying to get this knight as it lost its defender. Now, 20 seconds for black, 12.7 for white. you got to move here, you, but you also don't want your position to fall apart in a couple moves. So queen g6 is played. Knight takes, pawn takes. You get the 96, but your king is feeling safer without this knight on f5. So look at Lars keeping the position as closed, as locked as possible. Rook g8, there's knight e7. So Teddy goes in with knight f4. He says... This knight is doing well. Queen g2 is a blunder because the bishop takes f4, taking the knight, which is the defender of the queen, and protecting the white's queen at the same time. So he, we see a capture. d6 is a problem. He plays d5, but just take that thing. Take it twice. Knight e7, probably a good move as well, but I think taking with the pawn was good. That's a pass pawn. Now f5, Teddy strikes with the diagonal. And oh, knight f6 overlooked for sure. f5 is falling. This is a problem. Queen e7 can be played, but f4 defends. And I think this is turning in Lars's favor very quickly. So queen takes h5, rook takes f6 is probably the move that gives black some hope. But right now, black really cannot move the pieces. So queen g5, good move. Rook c6, watch out for the c2 pawn. That's the only place that can be attacked, but the queen needs to stay in g8. The rook comes back first. Now queen c7 is a possibility. Queen e6, blunders main one. Oh, missed it. Queen takes h7 was mate. That's what happens when the knight and queen lined up on h7 and overlooked by Lars. And he kind of laughs, I guess. Like, how could I miss that move? Now when the knight comes back to d5, white is still doing well. 1.4 seconds. Of, and he wins on time. He wins on time. And neither player can believe it. Are you kidding me? Are you joking? And Lars is laughing. He's like, what just happened? And that's because Lars missed checkmate in one move. And Teddy was finding these tricky, resourceful ideas with no time on his own clock. And he actually wins the game because Lars, his time elapses. And that's that. It's a 1-1 match. Wow. That was really an electric game there. First, Teddy was spending off the attack really well. Then Lars is still coming for him. And yet Teddy, he doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't see himself checkmated, which he allowed. And unfortunately for Lars, he loses in the clock. 1-1 match at this point. And we have a Dutch... And it's called the Raphael variation. So we're getting the Ninja Turtles here. F3, I don't know what this is, but E4 saying, let's just break this board open. And what's this pawn doing on A6? So in the Dutch, you play your pawn to F5. And we kind of have almost a stonewall situation. But A6, that feels like a slow move. And by playing in this manner, White is able to crack open the center of the board here. And your king is in the center. Sure, my king's in the center, but I can go this way and try to attack you uh, later. So this is very weird. I don't like the inclusion of a6. It seems that it's going to be promising for white, but Teddy is thinking here probably like, wait, this is not what I was looking at in my preparation either. So I see the evaluation bar says plus 1.2, 1.3. That's overestimating the position, at least from a human standpoint. Teddy's not sitting here and thinking, oh, I have this humongous advantage. He's like, I like my position because instead of this pawn being on a6, maybe a move like knight c6 would have been more useful for black, but this is where we are. And e5 is tempting. Taking on d5 makes sense, opening the position even more. This bishop can come to d3, have an open line to work with. You can castle this way. We're going to castle in opposite directions. And this bishop does have more 
flexibility because the pawn e6 is no longer there. But there's so many weakened squares, vulnerable squares. And these light squares, there may be a bishop here for now. But if this bishop gets traded, white puts a rook on the e-file, watch out. You know, look at this control for the white side here. So I like Teddy's position out of the gates. And as we see here, a bishop trade is offered. And black can say, I want to play queen d7 to defend, but not so fast. My knight jumps in with tempo. Doesn't look very good. Queen c8 would defend, but then that queen's on c8. So instead, Lars brings the knight into e4. But if I take on e7, wait a sec. Let's go back a quick moment here. Take on e7, queen takes e7. Do I have knight takes d5, knight takes d2? No, because here, captures, captures. That's a check to your king. Take back, I'll take this one. And then finally, your knight on e7 is under attack. I was just trying to take everything and see what happened. But black ends up a piece ahead. So that would not have been good. So instead, we saw capture on e4, capture on e7, and there goes the knight to e5. And we see a position here where black has a bishop, white has a knight, white has the better pawn structure. And in fact, saying take on e5 because I will not recapture. I don't have to recapture. I would take your bishop on f5. So that's why Lars castles. And we can see a capture, trade of knights. This pawn e4, is it a strength? Is it a weakness? It's an isolated pawn, but it's a pass pawn. And isolated pawns are bad because they're harder to defend. You want to protect the pawn with another pawn because when the more valuable pieces start attacking it, that way you don't have to deal. And Teddy says, oh, speaking of deal, look at my knights in the center here, hitting your queen. Queen d6 covers the c7 square. The knight is still defended. Knight back to e3, hopping around after this bishop. And where's that bishop going? It goes to e6. The e4 pawn does not feel quite as safe. So I would probably take on d7 and maybe even consider d5 myself. Why not? Try to push and go after this pawn, take over space, bring a rook to d1. Hey, that's a pass pawn for myself. Just like your e4 pawn is passed, but a knight is a great blockader. So we'll see if this kind of thing happens. Lars is on the clock here trying to figure out, well, where does my bishop go? Can I leave it there for now? He plays knight takes e5, leaving it. The knight can capture on f5, which hits the queen, uh, but the queen can move somewhere to attack this knight right back. And remember, this pawn on d4 is pinned, so the knight on e5 is not actually captured. So Teddy, sitting and thinking, he has a choice of two. Which piece are we going to take on f5 with? Because you cannot take on e5, you drop your queen on d2. That would be a big blunder. So which piece are we going to use to take this bishop? If knight takes f5, knight f3 check would be a good idea if not for rook takes f3. And the reason why I say knight f3 check, it blocks the rook's defense of this knight. But after pawn takes, rook takes, maybe this is okay for white if I steal your next pawn, but I don't like this open king. That worries me uh, for sure. So I would not want to take with the pawn, but you can take with the rook on f3. But Teddy says, oh, let me take with the rook. My knight can follow suit. My next rook can come over to f1. And hey, I'm trying to remove some of the important pieces around your king. So your rook on f8 is more valuable in this position. Knight c4, knight g4 would be good tactics if the f8 rook were not hanging with check. The reason why is, well, knight c4, you can just take with the knight. So that's my knight g4. I'm threatening to checkmate you here. If you take, the rook takes f5. That's not good, of course. But the problem is I take on f8 with check, and then I take your knight. So that distraction tactic will not work out. And that's why Lara's sitting and thinking, well, where does my knight go? Should I leave it here and take this first? But then the knight hops in, this rook follows, this queen come to g5. That doesn't look so fun. That looks kind of scary for my king. And my pawn structure is worse. That's an isolated pawn, whereas white has all the pawns in a row here. Everything is nicely uh, compact. And queen d7, hitting the knight, keeping this pawn on d4 pinned. So what next? Queen f to g5, rook to f1. Both these moves do make sense to me. Uh, if rook f1, maybe we'll see rook to f8, just following the rook along the f line. Knight f3 check is still a possibility after rook to f1. Let's not forget about that tactic, where I can block your defense of the knight by sacrificing my own knight. So queen g5 does make sense, but then you're leaving this pawn on d4. That will feel a little bit vulnerable, though the knight has to move out the way first. That will give you a tempo to play more like c3 next. So queen f4, similar idea as queen to g5. And now the knight really is under attack. This pawn e4 is under attack. And that's just the simpler move. Sometimes we get in our heads, we need to be super aggressive. We put our queen to g5, but queen f4 says, I'm going to win your pawn e4. Keep talking about that. That's a weakness. It's isolated. Let me go after it. It's not defended. And now two pieces in the center are under attack, and this pawn on e4 is falling. So we'll see here. What can Lars do? He is down nearly 20 seconds at this point. 
He can make a move like knight to c6, which saves the knight, but it does not save his pawn on e4. And by the way, we should watch out for a queen g4 move because when we get pieces in line with each other, we can think about what happens when the piece gets out of the way. But of course, let's take this pawn e4 first. The major downside is the rook coming to e8, taking over an open file, attacking the queen. But that's why I'm saying queen g4 is a possibility because if these queens get in line with one another, and there could be a discovery with the knight hopping out the way. And the players, they're feeling the pressure right now. I see them there. Teddy trying to figure this out, hand on face. Lars sitting back, but his eyes, that's all you need to know. Is look at those eyes. He is really just trying to figure out, I'm down a pawn here, but I should have compensation. I have an open file. This D4 pawn needs to have an eye kept on it. So Black's pieces are doing quite well. You have a rook that's developed, and here we go. What was I telling you? Lining this up. Watch out for knight h6 check. So the king might have to come to h8, but that costs you a move. And then white can play a move like c3 perhaps and defend this pawn on d4. d5 is possible. The queen will not be able to capture it because the g7 pawn is hanging with checkmate. But that's why king h8 was played, just getting out of the way of this discovery. Knight h6 can still be played because the queen is protected, but that's not a move you want to play unless it comes with force. So knight to h6, not what you want. So g6, then maybe the knight comes to h6 or to e3 to defend the queen. The point being that you cannot take my knight because your queen is under attack. So we have a stare down of queens, my knight comes and defends, but actually in this kind of situation, you may just get your rook into e2 and that gives black some real compensation along the second rank here. That active rook is nice. So we'll see how Lars responds here. He is down a pawn. So even if he trades queens, gets that rook down to e2, it may look good, but are you getting your material back? Is it enough? Is this rook going to come to f1 and actually do the same thing? And that would be worse because the black king is on that side of the board. And there are plenty of checkmating nets that you could fall into. For example, g6, let's say we get this position with a queen trade, rook e2, and you say, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and take your pawns. Then my rook gets to f7. My next move is knight f6, and I'm going to go checkmate you on the h7 square. So that's a mating net with the king being on h8, and you may start taking pawns. Good for you. Well, it's checkmate because my knight covers the last square. This is not going to happen, but these things can happen, especially as we get into the bullet portion of these Blitz games, right? Right now, right now, white has a minute and 10 seconds. Black has 27 seconds. So Lars is down on the clock. You make a quick move that you regret, and you could actually find yourself checkmated. So Teddy makes a very good decision, just brings his knight back instead of bringing the rook to F1. That was more tactical in nature, felt unnecessary. You kind of want to keep the rooks on the board. Uh, so queen e7, watch out, your knight's under attack, rook e1, you're walking into a pin, but you also know your knight can come to c2, which defends the e1 square. So queen g3 played, rook e1 now makes sense, rook f1 if you want to trade the rooks. I'm not sure you really want to trade the rooks that badly, but Teddy says, don't mind if I do, it makes me feel safer, I don't have to worry about my king, I am up a pawn, so if I can trade rooks and I trade queens, that's the ideal situation. So we see the rook trade, step one, now let's see if we get the queen trade. Knight g3, knight f5, that's... A good looking idea. Knight e3 can come to d5 or f5. Knight f5 actually threatens to win this pawn. That's why the king moved up to h7. But queen f5 check. Okay, Teddy had a chance to trade queens or check and take on b7. That king on h7 is in a bad spot. But so Teddy's taking up space. Now knight d5 goes after this pawn here. c6, your pawn structure is cemented over there on the queen side. That leaves the b7 pawn as a potential target. So knight e6 play defending, not committing to a pawn structure choice. Now play c6. This knight should come back to e3. I believe, and then try to go back over to F5. You have this D6 square that could be annoying as well. So no forks, but 92 check could be dangerous for this king. I like Knight F5 as a possibility here. Knight D3 is an option, but the queen would just move. Knight G6 played. Queen needs to stay in line with the knight. Queen B8 check. I feel like if you go Knight D6, Queen F4 happens, and you may win the B7 pawn, which is actually not easy to win because you walked into a pin, but you're getting your queen away from the safety of this king. And this king could be susceptible to some kind of perpetual check. So here comes Knight F4. Watch out for the king. 11 seconds. Teddy is the one in more time trouble all of a sudden, and he goes King H2. That way he can push his G pawn and tell the king. That looks weird to me. 97 check. 97 looked good. You could have forced the queens off. Queen F5. He takes this pawn. He has no fear. He's, I don't need to trade queens. Queen d7 back and then queen f5. That's his idea. H4, which looks scary. Queen f5 check, trading the queens. You want a second pawn, you win the game. So queen e8 check, nice find there. This pawn, queen h8, you can go back and forth. He said it goes queen e4, h4. There was knight f5. That's why g6 was played, protecting both squares. Queen comes back to e3. Now the pawn is pushing. Here goes that pawn. 
All right, knight to d6 is possible. Just don't blunder checkmate here. So queen here, knight g4. That's a really good defensive place. Queen e5 check if you want it. Trade, take with a pawn. You are up two pawns. B5 is tempting, but I wouldn't go there just yet. But B5 would spring free this outside pass pawn. King e3 is a blunder. Knight c2 checks. <gasps> he lost in time! Wow! Oh my gosh. And look at Lars. He's just like, uh, karma, my friend? You know, we're in a pretty even matchup right now, but I know what happened in game two. Game three, it's your time to lose. So, wow, wow, wow. I cannot believe that that just happened here. Oh, my gosh. What a match we've had. It's two to one. Lars Oscar Haug in the lead. Teddy Coleman up two pawns in that final position. Wow. I don't even know what to make of this. So, I will take the time during this break to get my head back in order. Both players really playing some exciting chess. We'll be right back after this short break. And I'm not GM Speech Chess Championship match brought to you by chess.com. And in this matchup between I am Teddy Coleman and I am Lars Oscar Haug, it is a two-to-one lead 
for Lars, the Norwegian player. He has jumped ahead of Teddy. He won game one. Teddy struck back in game two. And Lars wins game three on the clock, down two pawns in the position. But fair is fair. Teddy did win game two on time when he was in a losing position. So it evens out. Right now, Lars is the lead. But both players should be feeling pretty confident. They've done a good job. They've gotten the positions they've wanted. And particularly in this game three, with the white pieces, Teddy should be happy with how the game went. So it's a close one. It's anybody's match at this point. And they are playing in this quarterfinals match here. There's $300 to the winner. The next $300 is split by win percentage. So every game counts. Every point counts. And these players, they just want to move on. They want to win this tournament. That's their focus. And both of them, they have their chances. So the games are about to get back, and here we go. We have game four underway, and we have F4 on move one by Lars. So he goes for the bird's opening, and this is seen as somewhat risky from White's point of view because anytime you push this golden pawn, this pawn F2, the pawn F7, your king can get in more danger. You open up a diagonal against your king, so that can be a problem as the game continues. And look, knight F6, very simple development by Black. If knight G4 comes at the right moment, you're already eyeing scores like E3 and F2. So White is the one who needs to be a bit careful. He plays E3, and he's kind of a player of my own heart. It's that kind of stuff I play in online blitz. And now watch out. With the bishop and knight here, if E4, E5 comes, that will win a a piece so e4 is not defended right now and this bishop can just drop back to h7 preemptively saying i know what you're up to but watch out for a timely e4 move that will be problematic for black but for now too many pieces are covering the square so it's not actually a direct threat so black can play a move like c5 knight to d7 just developing all these pieces all your miners are now you got to move e4 is coming and that would be devastating to see because I attack your bishop and then I play e5. So you should either move your bishop, say, to b4. That way, if e4 is not even possible because your knight is pinned, but even if it were possible, e5 doesn't win a piece. And alternatively, you can drop your bishop back to h7 or to g4 to make sure e4 doesn't even come with the tempo. So Teddy does play bishop h7. He has just over four minutes. Lars over four and a half minutes for himself. So the opening battle, I would say, has been won by White. Even though Black's position is solid, there's no weaknesses. It's about the time. And I like the fact that Lars is up by half a minute. And Teddy can think at some point about playing E5. That's a reasonable choice. But with the king still in the center, I probably wouldn't commit to that just yet. Queen E7 speaks to me. That way you retain some flexibility. Just, where's my king want to go? Does it want to go king side? Can I go queen side? If you go queen side, you may be walking into an attack because you don't have that many defenders over there. But at the same time, maybe you can launch an attack against this king on g1. When there's a pawn f4, that looks good because it takes up space, but also it's easier to crack with move like g5. So that's why I'm thinking perhaps Teddy wants the castle long and get his king away from White's king. And Lars, he strikes too quickly for that even to be considered. So Teddy does play e5. That way White can't do the same. And now... I'm not really threatening to take on f4. I'm just going to leave my pawn in place if I'm thinking about this from Teddy's perspective. This pawn stops a lot of white's activity, and this bishop on c1 is behind the pawn. If you commit to f5, that's a really risky choice. While it makes the bishop on h7 look pretty bad, the, there's no more pawn tension, and your pawn e4 isn't exactly the soundest pawn there is, and black would try to get at that pawn and castle very likely to the queen side. So... Remains to be seen how Lars reacts. He does play f5. So I like it from a the point of view that it makes his bishop look bad. At some point, there could be h3, g4, g5, especially if this king comes this way, which is why I think the king should end up going to the queen side. But it's not risk-free there. This bishop comes to e3, puts pressure on the a7 pawn, for example. These pawns can start pushing up the board. So I do prefer white's position. I think that Lars should be confident. He should be enjoying the current dynamic. But as the game continues, this bishop on g2 isn't exactly the best piece, and it's going to need to defend this pawn on e4. That's what black would like to attack. So let's see. What can black do now? a4. This says, hey, you don't want to castle this way. And a5 says, you're right. I probably don't want to castle queenside. You still can, oddly enough, because while you've pushed a pawn in front of your king, it's hard to attack, and by playing a5, b4 is not going to happen. So Teddy plants his knight in c5. This pawn is under attack. I would have considered 
putting the bishop on b4 first and then attacking this knight on c3. But okay, knight c5, it does make sense, putting pressure on the e4 pawn. Bishop e3 drops the pawn directly. This queen is doing an important job defending the pawn. So white needs to figure out how to continue. In knight d2, it makes sense opening up all the pieces to defend this pawn. So <laughs> this whole game is centered around, well, the center, this e4 pawn. And black would like to play g6, but you'll notice that knight on f6 would have lost its defender, which is why Teddy brought his knight back to d7 first. And g6 can be played in the near future, trying to open up this bishop on the diagonal. So Lars has developed very normally. All the pieces have a function here. Black's pieces, not quite as much. So bishop g5 could be played to try to offer an exchange of those bishops, but this bishop can even drop right back to g1, say, my bishop is better than yours. I don't want to trade. And of course, rook to d1, trying to get this d6 square is possible if this bishop were ever to leave the e7 square. So I do like white's position. It seems easier to play. Both players concentrated right now. Bishop g8. Wow. f6? Let my bishop play in this game too? Okay, that's actually pretty reasonable. Because if you play f6 and say bishop f7, then you can castle more safely. So bishop f3 says if you play f6, guess what? I'm going to give you a check on the diagonal. That's a pretty clever play by Lars, responding to Teddy's move with a bishop move of his own. And, well, what now? F6, check, bishop F7, takes, takes. This doesn't look very friendly for the king. It's never going to find true shelter. So that's why Lars put his bishop on F3. And just to show you the difference is, let's say had he played rook to D1, F6, yeah, you get your one check, but bishop F7 blocks it, and that's a queen, that's a bishop. The bishop wins that battle. So that's why Lars played bishop to F3. Teddy here sitting and thinking, trying to figure out, all right, what, what next? How do I do this? Do I try to push G6? Like, is that actually a reasonable try to free this bishop up? Or is that going to open the position and the king is in the center? Can I castle to the queen side? My king can't castle king, so there's a bishop in the way. And if I castle queen side, am I somehow going to walk into a mating attack? And the most important thing right now is look at Teddy time. He has a minute and nine seconds and a tough position. So he does, in fact, allow the trade of bishops. If I'm Lars, I'm trading there, and I'm going after this king. And that might involve a g4, an h4, a g5, something like that. But Teddy's going to say, you can't check with me that quickly. I do have some time. Maybe that includes a queen d8, queen e8 to trade the queens. Rook d8 was played instead. Let's try to trade some rooks. But this rook, you're playing a rook down in the position because the rook is stuck behind the king. And the king can't get out because the queen's on h5. And what, king g8, king uh, h7? No, I'll put my queen on g6 and check you off. So your king can't even move out the way. So here comes rook to d1. This position, no fun for black, none whatsoever. And what next? If you gave black, okay, of course, black is threatening to win a piece. But if this piece were not hanging, what is black's actual plan here to get the pieces out? And on the flip side, white needs to make use of this open line. That's essential here. Maybe bishop takes c5 is a move. And after takes, you take this knight on b6. I'm trying to get my rook somewhere along this d file. If my rook gets in the game, black is in some huge, huge trouble. I'm just not quite seeing the knockout blow right now. So Lars, he's sitting and thinking he does have over two minutes to Teddy's 56 seconds, but we've seen the clock dwindle. We somehow seen players who have had way more time spend too much of it and then they're the ones who are scrambling to make the final moves of the game. So right here, Lars takes that pawn on a5. Okay. This knight moves out the way. This is under attack. So knight takes a4. Seems pretty reasonable at this point. And this e4 pawn isn't that well defended. Talked about this a long time ago. But if this knight on c3 can be removed, then this pawn on e4 becomes a target later in the game. So... I move like knight c4, I can just take this knight and then take this pawn and steal your central pawn. But this dynamic here is the most problematic. The black king can't get out. So you need to somehow get this rook. If you could play rook jumps over king to d8, your position is perfectly acceptable. But with your rook stuck on h8, you're not a happy camper. So knight takes on a4. This pawn on b2 is under attack. If knight c4, there is b5 that is available to black. And this b2 pawn might be lost and where's this knight actually going? So suddenly this is turning around and Teddy has 35 seconds. Lars has a minute 25, still more time for white, but Teddy's moves are becoming a bit easier. So if he can play them quickly, 
then he can try to bounce back here. And I see that that move was not approved of. And knight d2 was played. And I don't think that's going to uh, do the trick. I think a move like rook a1 actually trying to get the open a file would have been useful for white. But instead, knight to d2. So can you just take this pawn? Because the rook, if it goes to a1, I just go knight a4 back and I close down the a file. The queen c8 play instead. Queen e8 is probably the plan. And I want to play king f7 really, really badly. So if I play queen e8, and your queen moves back somewhere, and then I can move my king up. That's the goal. So look at this. You see the eval bar. It's going down. King f7 or king g8, king h7. You do have some time. Knight h4, knight g6 does look scary, but Teddy's going to go king to h7 and rook to g8 as the knight comes in. Look at this. Rook to g8. He has 11 seconds left, so he is down on time, but his position is getting better. This pawn's under attack. If you push it, in comes his knight to c3, which attacks the rook, attacks the pawn. I guess that white needs to be a bit careful here as it looks promising, just if you could take on h6 and follow up with queen takes h6, it would be checkmate, but your rook would somehow need to be on the h file to do the trick, and that's far away. So how is Lars going to take over here? Knight c3, I'm jumping in. Thank you. Don't mind if I do. Give me this pawn. And you have to give me this pawn. You can play rook e1, and that defends the pawn tactically, or so it would seem. But after rook e1 takes bishop h6, Haha, ha, knight f2, that is a fork. I don't have to recapture your bishop. Instead, I check you and I win your queen in this manner. So that is something to keep an eye on uh, that black has available. Rook a1, rook a7. Okay, I see this. That looks threatening. But what if you move the bishop, queen a6 is checkmate. He loses on time. Teddy just loses on time. He couldn't find a move. And he loses on time here. And I get it. Just bring up, I'm going to bring up that end position very quickly just to show you the final tactic. That queen takes h6 check was the threat. If you move this bishop anywhere, let's say to c5, queen takes h6 is checkmate because the king is on h7, the g7 pawn is pinned. And that's why Teddy, he couldn't find a move and he just loses on the clock. Because look at this, your bishop's under attack. You know queen takes h6 is coming. What are you to do here? It's just that kind of position. Probably queen d8 to get into d1. That was necessary to counter against this king, but really difficult to find with just a few seconds on the clock. So I understand how Teddy saw that game. It's like, yeah, this one's gone. And really that game was about time management, but also Lars, give him credit. He kept preventing Teddy from finishing his development. That rook on h8, it made one move. It went to g8 eventually at long last, but Teddy didn't have enough time to figure out the rest of the game. So credit to Lars. He played a nice game there. And Teddy with the white pieces, now we have a more standard setup. It's a Nimzo Indian. The bishop comes to b4 to pin this knight. Maybe he'll take it at some moment and the pawn will have to capture, but you have double pawns there, but Teddy has not wasted a move playing a3. So if a3, then black is more inclined to take the knight because white spent this turn playing a3, which doesn't help the rest of the board. Bishop b2 says, okay, you can take on c3. I'll take with my bishop, but he also could have castled. And he may not have spent time playing a3, but Lars says, I'm going to get your bishop. Teddy says, that's fine with me. I'll take right back with my rook and look at my bishop on d3, staring at your king. My knight is developed, so I'm perfectly happy with this position. So it's just, you know, a standard a strategic battle, I should say, where white has the bishop pair, and you can try to keep the bishop pair with bishop e1, but look at the stronghold over the e4 square by black's pieces, and you have to watch out because this queen can venture in, this rook can also lift its way up to the sixth rank, and then this attack could be dangerous for the white king. But strategically, now I keep talking about this as a strategic uh, versus a tactical battle in a way, that this is also kind of risky because if white is able to break through on the queen side, you may not have enough time to attack the white king because white is infiltrating uh, on the queen side. So A5 played. If takes, I think that Lars will throw in knight takes c3, and that way the rook can recapture on a5. I don't want to take back with the pawn because then white has access to the c5 square. And so if this capture, knight takes c3 removes the guard of the a5 square, and then the rook can capture. So Lars actually voluntarily takes on c3, brings his knight to d7. Guess what? Then they can come to f6, and then you know where, maybe the e4. You can also play for e5 as you have that square defended. So Teddy needs to figure out all right, what's the best way to react right now? Do I put my queen on b3 to eye this e6 pawn? Eh, maybe not. Do I put my queen on c2 to stop e5 because the f5 pawn is saying, well, then I lose sight of my knight on f3, right? Bishop takes f3 as possible. So it's even individual moves at this point are not so easy for white. I think black's position is much more simple. 
your plan, you brought your knight out. Okay, maybe I'll go knight f6. Maybe I'll go queen f6. Maybe I'll go rook f6. Maybe I'll go e5. I see all of these options for black, whereas white's moves, for the most part, tend to have some kind of drawback. And queen e2 was played. This knight can simply hop in to f6 and then maybe to e4. Uh, this pawn, as mentioned, go e5. But I believe Teddy's idea is to take and then push his pawn to e4. So no e5, e4 for you. Just like in the last game when Teddy was black, he saw that e pawn mobilizing. He said, I can also push my own. So we uh, have this set up knight f6, good move by Lars, trying to bring this knight into e4. I would not be surprised if Teddy drops his knight back to d2 to deal with that idea. And e5, even if it were an attack twice, is not possible just yet because the f5 pawn is hanging and needs the e6 pawn defense, which means perhaps d5 is a good move, right? I just talked myself into this. I saw e5 isn't available to black because it's f5 pawn, but d5 is possible because of this very same f5 pawn. And Teddy moves the rook back to c2 first. That way, knight e4 did not come with a tempo. And Lars says, okay, queen e7. Teddy says, don't mind if I do. Let's break open the queen side. And now he has two pawns and the rook, defending the square. This rook can double on the c file if black does capture. And, well, white looks like... First to the punch. C6 is not out of the question either. It closes down the queen side in large part, but it pushes the bishop back and takes over some space. So C6, I wouldn't, that's not my first instinct. I don't want to play that move, but it's something you should consider. And if you're Lars, you may consider putting your bishop on one of these two squares just to get outside of the pawn if C6 is indeed the play. So bishop e4 to trade bishops, try to get this knight in here. Bishop d5 says, you can't kick my bishop off this great d5 square, so I don't mind if I sit on it. So let's see. Lars down 10 seconds. He takes, so a takes b. Oh, you don't. You can actually decide to take this first. If you want to open the c file, you could take on b6 and then take this back, because by taking on b6, you're attacking the c7 pawn. So Teddy has a choice, but he shouldn't spend too much time making his move here. That's been a fatal flaw of his. We've seen him in pretty decent positions, and then he has 10 seconds left. So right now is not the time to sit and think for a minute, maybe think for half a minute, because it does change the trajectory of this game, but you cannot burn all of your time on this one move. And he's still thinking. Two minutes and 15 seconds of counting down. Lars now has a pretty significant lead on the clock. And I do like White's position. I don't see a huge problem with it, but I'm going to see a problem with it if he keeps thinking. And I guess you could actually throw the move c6 as well, pushing the bishop back and then taking on b4. So he does have a lot to consider. I get it. I'm fully on board with it. But we've seen what happens to him when he spends all his time, and that's why I am advocating against it. So he's still thinking here, still hasn't made a move. Just make one. you got to make a good move quickly rather than the best move slowly. So what I'm trying to figure out what he's even considering and what he's actually going to do here. He takes on b6, and... If I'm Lars, I would even just take back right away. I don't want to calculate, is this rook takes c7 happening? I see the bishop can take on f3. But Lars spent essentially 10 seconds to Teddy's a minute and 15 seconds. And that's the biggest difference right now. This knight gets the d5 score. It is a monstrous piece here. It stops any kind of rook c7 ideas. It puts pressure on the b4 pawn. This pawn can go to b5. But you want to double on the c file. And then it's like, well, so what? You double on the C file. No, no, no. You're not getting in. And this knight on D5 is helping. So maybe white will play E4, rook on C1, E4 type of stuff. That way you can challenge this knight and trade it off. But that's very committal as well because your D4 pawn becomes weaker and all that stuff. So rook to B1 play, protecting the B4 pawn, making sure that your queen is free to move. But move to where? What's the plan? Maybe bishop C4 to take this knight. I don't really like leaving this diagonal because I just have this in the back of my mind. If, if the black bishop gets to e4, that can be a problem. And actually e4 would be a big blunder because of moves like rook takes d3 and knight f4 and this e4 pawn is a problem. It's hanging. So do not play e4 here. I do not recommend that. And what else can I recommend? This queen is doing an important duty of defending this uh, bishop, also the c3 square. The knight would like to jump in, you know, queen e2, knight c3, thank you for material. So white's position remains harder to play. Maybe bishop b5 and bishop c6. That way at least it, I'm 
infiltrating on one of the c file squares and maybe two of them because the c8 square is also defended by the bishop and my bishop on d3 isn't doing all that much so actually bishop b5 to c6 looks very reasonable just trying to get this bishop off and rook a8 says okay i'm gonna take over the a file still i'm looking at this idea for white like let me get my bishop in and h3 okay deliver it Let's see what black can do. So I was looking at it from white's perspective. Now I'm going to flip over to black's perspective. How do I improve here? If my knight goes to f6, is it coming to e4? Perhaps, but I'm giving up the c7 square. So queen e8 was the choice. Queen can come to a4. Queen can come to h5. I like the flexibility of this move. And it also stops the idea I was talking about, bishop b5 to c6. So Teddy goes bishop c4, but he doesn't want to take this. The bishop lands on d5, and that's not exactly promising for white's position. So knight e1, that way I don't blunder my knight on the square. The g-pawn is pinned. So knight takes something, like knight takes e3 is a big threat here. So knight e1 is played. This knight could also try to go to the f4 square eventually. Probably not yet. Bishop f1 can be played just to defend the g2-pawn. And if this knight were here, then you could take on d5 and put your knight on f4. So it'd tactically be okay. But look at Teddy, rook a2, good move. 34 seconds left. Lars now under min on the clock. A rook trade is offered, and with one pair of rooks off, white feels less cramped. White did have less space. So by trading off the rooks, there is more space for your remaining pieces. F4, watch out for a shot like that, because this rook on b1 is in line with the queen, but the bishop is defending that square for now. So F4 probably doesn't work out. Rook c1, say, well, open file. Let's take it. Now I can consider taking on d5 to get my rook to c7. Doesn't quite do the trick just yet, so I wouldn't take on d5 until it's necessary. So... Knight d3, is knight d3 possible? Because if you take on e3, I take back with my pawn and g2 is protected. If knight d3, knight takes b4, I guess that's one of the problems. Knight f4 hits the queen though and does both. So interesting moment here. Maybe there's rook takes a2 though. That's probably the biggest issue. Is there's like all these tactics at play here. Knight c3 at some point, but rook takes a2 should do the trick because you take here, take, and this is under attack. This is under attack here takes, takes, and thank you for your rook at the end. So that's the problem with moving your knight from e1. The tactics will favor black. So bishop c4, knight f6, bishop d3, knight e4. Okay, pieces are moving. Trades are being offered. Finally, that knight is out of there. But when you play f3, look at the e3 square. And when you look at e3, look at d4. A pawn chain is only as strong as the base of the pawn chain. This is the base now. Before it was on f2 and everything was safe. Now it's an e3, which doesn't feel quite as good. But look at Teddy. Brings the knight in. And he's out of five seconds. He's got to move. Queen c3 offering the queen trade. He thinks that he's getting safer by doing this. We have a trade knight back to c3. b5, knight a4. Watch out, because this pawn could be a target. But that's why the knight trade is offered. And I believe that this position is quite level. But with Teddy's clock being at 5.7 seconds left, that's how things can go wrong. Even if you have an objectively drawn position, you can blunder into things. But look, all the pawns are in dark squares. So this bishop is strong, but it can't attack anything. And the king can't get in. There's no access points for the king. So I would just, you can even leave the pawns and put your bishop to c4. No king e6 for you. And yeah, he's going to shuffle back and forth. And there's no threat. Like you can take on f4. I just take back. These pawns are all defending. So it takes 2.8 seconds though. You got to move. 3.1, not showing the steadiest bullet hand throughout this match thus far. Bishop e2, he could play. Or he's going to trade everything and play bishop e2 now. But f4, the king starts getting in. You have to be a little bit careful here. Bishop d3, but he made it 0.3 seconds up. <gasps> oh, I lost in time again. He can't control it. Right now, it's slipping away because he has no time remaining. And Teddy, in those moments, he's just spending too much time early, and he's not showing the confidence when he gets into just under 10 seconds remaining. He's the one who's nervous, and he can't make the move in time, and that's why Lars has his 4-1 to lead. Even though that position was objectively equal, or you saw the zeros in the eval bar, didn't have time to reach the conclusion that he wanted. So now he has the black pieces. Lars goes for a more standard opening instead of the birds opening with one f4. We see that we're in pretty much a, a normal position. Bishop out in f4, reminiscent of the London system, but the pawns on c4. So it's kind of like a hybrid, like instead of just a London with a closed dynamic, it's an open London. And castles kingside makes sense. White is going to try to castle kingside soon as well. Bishop e2 first. 
and castle. And black can play for c5. This is a standard way to chop at white center. As you push the pawn to c5, you say, I'm going to trade some pieces off. My knight wants to go to c6, but it doesn't attack anything without the pawn putting pressure on the center. So I like the move c5 here. Teddy is considering his options. He plays knight to d5, which I also like. If you take, and I take with the pawn, well, how are you going to win back this pawn on c4? Not seeing it. And otherwise, I'm threatening to take on c3 and win a pawn in this manner. So knight takes, pawn takes, bishop takes. Where is this rook going? Where is this rook going? Here, here, rook c1, bishop b2. This rook has nowhere to go. And yet the computer still likes white. Maybe there's some kind of queen b3, queen takes b7, like rook b1, something like this, where you end up getting the b7 pawn and the c7 pawn is also under attack. So it's funny how you can kind of blunder and it still works out well for you. Sometimes these things happen. And chess is strange like that. And knight g5 also is an idea in such a position. So bishop took and went back to a5. This is smarter. And it's the second time where Teddy with the black pieces has stolen a pawn. In the earlier game, he took this g4 pawn and he was doing a good job of fending off the attack. Here, there won't be an attack, but it's going to be a positional grind where black's pieces don't exactly have that much space. And this pawn c7 needs to have an eye kept on it, but this bishop can just sit on b6 which defends the b-pawn along the file, and it protects c7 directly. So this knight can now develop. I prefer the black's position in the blitz game. I see that the evaluation bar says white has a slight edge. It's because the center looks good. You're fully developed with your minor pieces and your rook's out. That, that's all good. That all looks great. But how do you actually say, I'm in this for the long run? And you are down a pawn, and you start feeling that as the game continues. You're like, wait, am I going to get my material back? Is there a way for me to maybe lose some of my activity, but gain material back. And I see the queen e2 was played and the eval bar dropped a little bit. And that's how tricky these positions are. I don't know the perfectly precise move in that position, but clearly queen e2 was not the number one best move. And it, but it makes perfect sense. You're playing e4 to get this bishop and to push your pawns in the center, bring this rook to d1, where your rook's in line with his queen. So I get what white's doing and yet it's saying, oh, black is doing really well. And it's because black has an extra pawn. So h3, no bishop g4 for you. If I played e4 too soon, maybe you'd play here, and then my d4 pawn is weak. So instead, h3 is played. This knight can go to f6, but that gives the e5 square to the knight. So it's a four jump for both. And Teddy does go knight f6. He's saying, my extra pawn speaks volumes here. Maybe he'll play c6. Maybe he'll play bishop c7. The bishop on a5 isn't exactly doing that much. It's taking away the e1 square from a rook, but the rook doesn't really need to or want to go to the e1 square anyway. So I think that c6 would be a reasonable play, especially if you can get bishop c7 to follow. And maybe knight d5 move is coming as well, because if I get knight to d5, I'm attacking this. Maybe I have some knight c3 ideas. So Lars plays bishop h2. I like that move. If you want to play knight d5, go ahead. Now I have e4 with the fork. My bishop on f4 is no longer under attack. So I like this move, bishop h2. It's just saying I'm going to play safely, but now knight e4 is reasonable. Bishop e4 is also reasonable. And c6, as I mentioned, it's played. You can play b5, not now, because the c6 pawn's under attack. But if you wanted to be aggressive, b5 was available. The knight's on e5, f3, maybe e4 to come, maybe g4 hitting this bishop. So black still lacks a bit of like play for the pieces. Your pieces are about to get attacked and white's pieces are perfectly safe in this position. Knight d5, there's e4. Okay, not great. Bishop c7, that looks good. Knight d7 perhaps is next where I can trade off this knight on e5. And trading pieces should help the side with extra material. And in this case, it's black with an extra pawn. So knight d7 looks Plenty reasonable to me. And there it's played. So e4 is a possibility. The bishop can go sit back on g6. And maybe the knight will take it. But we're starting to trade pieces. This bishop on h2, I can capture it with check. And now we're getting into an easier simplification where black remains a pawn ahead. So bishop g6, f4, wow. F5, one of the ideas, there's a bishop on c4, very powerful. This knight on e5 wants to stay here. And Teddy needs to figure out, can he take on e5 with this knight? And perhaps d takes e5, it may look worrisome, but it would look even worse if this rook could come back to f1. 
but something like takes takes and g4 and f5 that doesn't look very fun who wants to see themselves get attacked in this manner it may not work out perfectly for white maybe there's like a queen h4 at some point and a bishop b6 check and maybe there's problems in white's position as well but it feels pleasant for white at first glance with a rook in the open file so teddy does take he plays bishop b6 and well queen h4 different move order same position that i was calling for but i see the eval bar it's in white's favor i don't know if i would agree with that from a practical point of view bishop h5 is kind of a threat because g4 loses sight of this pawn on h3 and he plays g4 voluntarily so he gives up this pawn to play f5 and trap the bishop okay wow now there is a lot to figure out here can i hmm what can you do here so queen h3 f5 bishop is trapped but can i take a bunch of times in f5 or is the king on g8 actually somehow worse than the king on h1 it's weird when you're pushing all your pawns and the king on h1 looks like there's a lot of air in front of it that could be dangerous but it's this king on g8 that could see itself in harm's way i would somehow take and after f5 i would like, allow this capture but i wouldn't take here i don't want this bishop to look strong so i'd make him like rook to d8 and after it takes take i say well is your bishop that strong you have a bishop for what three pawns here and your bishop isn't that powerful so something like this could be teddy's best bet and instead, he says, no, 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 I want my bishop. I'm going to play h5. And I see that eval bar, it approves. It's saying that black is just hanging right in this thing. But because white is down material, one pawn, in fact, and still the eval bar says it's you know, pretty decent, that would scare me. And just by the looks of this, right, aesthetically, white's position looks powerful. Look at all these pawns here marching forward. And bishop h7, maybe that's the move. I know you're giving up a pawn on e6, but the bishop would be free. And Teddy decides to keep the material but that's not the way to go, I don't I don't feel. And I would have taken with the G part, 100%. I would have taken this way and brought my rook to G. Oh, there's a bishop here. So I can't go rook to G1 just yet. But I wanted to go rook to G1. But that's uh, taking towards the center instead of away from it. And we get to this position where E6, very tempting. And the point of E6 is if you take, and I take with my pawn, I'm throwing E7 with check against your king. But it takes with the bishop. Now, this I don't like from Lars's point of view. I think that the position is opening up and somehow Black's king is getting safer unless there's some kind of timely bishop e5 and a checkmate here. But that's why Teddy went rook to d8. He's trying to trade off this attacking piece. Give me the d-file. And this pawn h3 is still hanging, by the way. You shouldn't forget about that. And I want to get my bishop to d4 where it defends this pawn in g7. So I will give you my b7 pawn. Have fun with this irrelevant queenside pawn. It may restore material equality, but it's not going to be sufficient. So I think the next rook can and maybe should come over to d8 as well. And said Tay says, trading one rooks is good enough. I'm taking on h3 now. g4 is under attack. If you take, bishop takes f5 can happen. Oh, Teddy's handling as well. And Lars has a minute and 10 seconds. Teddy is 41 seconds. So a lead on the clock for white, but black is up two pawns and it's white king that suddenly looks like it's in far worse shape. So Black was on the defensive. Now Black is on the offensive and up materials. That's not a good combination for Lars. And I would try to make a move like G5 just to go after this king somehow, but it could be a bit slow. F6, if it helps me get discovery against your queen, that should be considered. But F6, perhaps just rook takes F6. And then you're getting checkmate on the F1 square. So bishop C4 played clearing out space on the e-file maybe there's a quick little checkmating attack but i can play my rook to g8 my bishop to d4 my queen to c3 all of these possibilities but teddy takes in g4 and the <laughs> eval bar does not like that not one bit rook takes g7 is possible here that is a distinct possibility and there is play because king takes queen e7 check give me your rook with check and your king's in trouble 23 seconds left for teddy he needs to find a move here Queen f3 looks safe, but the problem is you trade queens as bishop lands on e5, your king's caught in the corner. That's not so safe after all. So, gotta move. Gotta move. He takes, bishop takes f5. What a brave choice. Queen e5, there's queen f3 checkmate. Okay, so this king is in trouble. This king is in trouble. I think that white's king looks like it's in worse shape, but where is the mate? Maybe rook g5 and queen e5 or queen b2 kind of thing? 
Rook G5 played, but oh my goodness, Teddy finds an instant. Wow, and he gets a, we got a fist pump from Teddy. We get a comeback time fist pump by Teddy. Let's look at that final position one more time. Uh, that was a really just crazy finish here. Rook G5, it clears out the diagonal for a check, but after Bishop E4 takes, Rook F1, Bishop takes, Queen takes, Bishop G1, that is check and mate. The Bishop defends. That king's caught in the corner. That would be a checkmate. So we'll go back to the new game here. But Teddy bounces back with a win. And now he gets the white pieces. He is down four to two. This has been an up and down match between these two. It's been pretty level. I mean, the score says what it says. It's clearly in Lars's favor. But I feel like during the games, just the chess on the board has been uh, both sides with chances, though Lars has been quicker. And we'll see how that helps him as we go to the quicker time controls. But Teddy, the white piece is now... Queen C2 Nimzo, and both sides playing a bit slowly, considering this is mainline theory. A3, if the bishop takes, you take with the queen. Here we go. And typically, black tries to strike in the center with D5. And here, Lars goes for the more solid approach at D6. And that's the play for pawn to E5. And only white has a dark square bishop. So if I can put my pawns on dark squares, your bishop doesn't have as great a scope. So it's a different style. It's perfectly reasonable. But if you play b4, bishop b2, hoping to use the diagonal, well, next knight can come to d7, this pawn, queen on e7, pawn e5, and it's actually not as promising as it may seem. Teddy energized now. Yeah, Teddy did seem pretty pumped, right? That was a crazy finish. And these momentum shifts really do happen, where you win one game where you're on the edge the whole way, and then you win and you find a checkmate at the end, you start feeling rejuvenated. You're like, this is my match. I can handle this. And there are just over four minutes in this longest time control. So we'll see um, if Teddy can get one more win. And uh, if he can do that, then he cuts the deficit in half because he's down by two points. But Lars going for the principal move, E5. We mentioned this pawn structure. Everything is settled. Now D takes E5 here for black. If you take with the queen, there's bishop takes F6. And I get to ruin your kingside pawn structure. So that's why I take with the pawn. Knight F3, simple development. Now you need to defend your pawn e5. And knight e4 is an idea at some point, just not yet, because I'll take your queen, and then you take my queen, but I take your rook at the end. So knight e4 should be thought about, and it goes to show when there's a pin, and the piece that's being pinned to is not a king, the piece can still move, and sometimes moving it is actually quite good, but just not yet. So sitting and thinking, and if you castle, maybe knight e4 is good. This castle... Knight e4, takes, takes, bishop takes, check, king h1. And this is a good lesson in not stopping your calculation early. I have two pieces for a rook, but where's my knight going exactly? Oh, that's right. It's not really going anywhere. So I'm like rook to e1 could just trap this knight in its place. So, you know, this is the kind of thing, the kind of tactics that these highly rated players, they're looking at. They're trying to see it all the way through. But Lars says, nah, I don't want to worry about that. Let me just play h6. Knight e4. Maybe it's a possibility in, in some universe, just not this one. And bishop h4, Teddy has to look out for pawn to g5. And will we see some kind of sacrifice on g5? Probably not. So g5, bishop g3, knight to e4. Yes, black has exposed his king somewhat by pushing his pawns there, but he forks the queen and the bishop. And Lara says, eh, you know, this, this is not your game. You can play g5 with a clear conscience. If I play g5, I'm going to be worrying for the rest of this one. So let's play bishop f5 first develop the piece, connect the rooks to one another. This pawn a4 means that b4, there will be an ampassant, so you can't just press forward on the side of the board. And maybe I'll try to use it for my knight. It's a good square to get into. And from white's perspective, maybe this pawn a4 has gone too far. Maybe later in the game, I can attack it with a quick bishop d1 or something like that and grab it. So Teddy goes knight to d2. I think we understand why. He is covering the e4 square so that there won't be a fork if this bishop has to go to g3, which makes g5 way less enticing. I don't want to play that anymore. It just opens up my king without any of the benefits of getting my knight into the e4 square. So Lars sitting and thinking. Teddy, once again, down almost a half minute on the clock. We've seen this pretty much throughout the entire match, where Teddy is the one with less time on the clock. And for Lars, he is up 4-2, four, four to two, should be happy about the chess he's played thus far, but when you lose one game, especially by getting checkmated, you start feeling, wait a second, am I calculating that well? You know, am I doing the right thing? And so Lars may be second guessing himself and just checking this position deeply. And look at him. He's just 
Okay, now he finally shifted his gaze, but before that, he was just staring at the board. I don't know what part of the board it was, but that was intense. He has a really a stare that just doesn't stop. So Lars takes a swig, calms down. Now he looks chill. So maybe he's going through the emotions on camera for all of us here, but you know, it's just a change in uh, just how he's looking at this position. And well, he's down 30 seconds. So what from up a half minute to down a half minute without making a move on the 15th turn, he plays Bishop H7, which is a move that he's a minute and a half for, but you're kind of like, for what? Why did you spend so much time on this move? And that's not to be overly critical of the guy. He's playing good chess and perhaps he just didn't see a, a better move to make, but these are the type of decisions you need to make more quickly. And I've been pretty harsh in a way on Teddy to this point for doing that. And now Lars, it's his turn where he didn't need to spend all of that time. And I do this myself. So it's kind of a do as I say, now as I do moment, but he didn't need to waste all this time playing Bishop H7. It's a move he could have played in 30 seconds rather than a minute and 30 seconds. So anyway, the Bishop's on H7. It's still on a great diagonal. Teddy doesn't have a clear plan to work with. F4 is like somewhat tempting if you want to rip open the position and try to get to this knight and pin it, but F4 carries its own risk where after the pawn takes, now this queen is looking good on the E file. So F4, I'm still interested. I'm looking at it, but I can understand why it would be a bad move, in fact, rather than a good one. So Teddy, now doing the same thing. If he plays rook A to D1 or something like that, it's like you didn't need to spend all this time playing rook A to D1. Or bishop F3, you don't need to spend all this time. But it's all right. You know, Maybe he's going to take and put his bishop on D5, or he's going to just take on C6 to give black a compromised pawn structure over here, I would play some kind of rook to d8, probably rook f to d8, because my rook feels important to take the a4 pawn. He chooses the a rook, and now there's this d3 square to use, thanks to this bishop on h7. So rook f to d1 makes some sense to me. Rook a to d1 also makes sense. Rook d3, you know, is what black is aiming for. So this is not out of the question either. Bishop takes c6, just to hurt the pawn structure. And another reason why it'd be better if this rook were here is this rook would come to b8 and put pressure on the b2 pawn. And then this rook on f8 would already be on d8 using the open line. So the rook on f8 is kind of not doing anything. And he takes in c6, b takes c6. You can throw in rook d3, that's possible. But I would have just taken on c6 as he does. And now Lars is at a minute in the clock and Teddy's position is getting worse. So he's going after this e5 pawn, I like that. That's a hanging piece. Rook e8, then I go rook to d1, and I don't have to worry about this d5. Rook d3, I say thank you for your pawn e5. Don't mind if I grab that one. So Lars has a tough choice. e4, knight d4, hitting the c6 pawn, and that shuts down your bishop. So I actually kind of like what Teddy just did there. I see that the evaluation bar has gone slightly, very slightly in black's favor. But in blitz chess, playing with double pawns is very difficult. I really feel that way. That having pawns like this is never fun. Having an isolated pawn here isn't that great either. Do not play rook to d2 because you are walking to knight e4, g5 first, but knight e4 second, and that's a fork. So Teddy now down to 57 seconds. He made queen a5 relatively quickly, a4, c7, e5. That queen is doing it all from the a5 square, attacking all these pawns. b2 can be captured, but do you really want this pawn for this pawn? Maybe the a pawn later in the game can become a runner, and that's not so fun. So... Bishop f6, queen f6, queen takes c7 is another idea. I think just taking on a4 makes the most sense, putting pressure on the next pawn on c6. And Teddy has 40 seconds left. He's half his opponent's time. Just got to make a move. Just got to play in the flow of the position here. And the more you think, oftentimes when you're in a scramble, you're, you make the worst moves, honestly. It's weird how that works. But these players are so strong that their intuitions are often correct. And he, when bishop takes f6, the eval bar, not a fan of this decision. And it frees the queen up, which puts pressure on this. Maybe there's going to be some bishop e4, right? Immediately attacking there. Wow. Back rank check me. I was like, did I just witness a really bad piece blunder? But if rook e5, you can just check me in the back rank. Queen a8 is mate. That's just mate. So that's why Lars said, I'm going to put my bishop on c2. Teddy's knight to g4, tempo against your queen. This rook is still under attack, so you need to move the queen out the way first. And where to? Queen g5 would trade the queens off the board. 
because your queen's under attack and your rook is under attack over here. But does black want to trade queens? Seems reasonable with this rook being very promising, but this could be a rook d2 at the end and that bishop is pinned. So we're getting far down the line here, but that's how you need to calculate. You really need to think deeply before trading queens and every move has its consequences. So Lars, deep in the think tank, where does the queen go? G6, E7, okay, E7 hits the A3, but look at Teddy. He says, my rook's under attack, but so is yours. You can take the rook, I'll take yours. You can take my knight, I'll take your bishop. So this is what's happening here. And he takes, we have this capturing queen E4 going after two pawns at once. He says, take my G4 pawn. This A pawn, I talked about it earlier, that's going to be a passed pawn for white, whereas this king, it lost one of its defenders, but maybe not the end of the world here. So it's a slight advantage for white. It's getting to, okay, the queen does protect this. I'm <laughs> watching out for blunders here. We are getting to that kind of time scramble. H5, here comes H4, rook D8 check. Now what, queen A8, is there a mate? Queen A8 and back here mate. Okay, queen D1, please take me. I'll bring my rook behind my pass pawn. So it's at H4, it's like, can we trade him by rook D4? Trade him rook D4. The pawn ending is winning because of this pass pawn. So Teddy is able to steal a pawn and now he wants to keep this pawn if he can. Not so easy. So he's going to go check. Oh, he could have thrown the check first. Check first and then rook D7 was better because F7 would have been hanging as well. So Teddy makes a slight inaccuracy. He can play rook D3, rook C3. He's going to do that. King up, king up this way, bring the king in. E4 is fine, but now the king can even come into C5. King D6, King C5. But King D6, there's C5 check. I guess you're just in time to do that. So Teddy is better here. Up a pawn, and it's in the past A pawn. And he has past pawns on both sides of the board. This is the flaw of double pawns. Is White is essentially up two pawns in this position if we think about it in terms of a king and pawn endgame. So Rook C3 back is possible. Plays it. This king wants to come to F5. King F5. Ooh, missed opportunity. That king could have run right into the G6 square. It's still coming up the board. G5, a king over this Rook D3. King G4, King H5. What's this king here? I'm not loving the way he's playing it, but his advantage is still huge. F6, you're going to trade and play rook d3 or rook g3 like that. Take the rook. Nice try. Cheeky move. And Lars's face. I thought he was doing it to be tricky, but he just didn't realize that his rook would be captured after rook takes a3. And wow, what an ending there to this game, to this time segment. We finished the five plus one time segment, four to three. Lars Oscar Haug in the lead. And for Teddy, you have to be counting your blessings there. You're like, whew, wow, I made it out only down one game after being down three. And for Lars saying, well, I've had big leads on the clock. There's something going wrong in some of these games. And Teddy is doing really well in transitions. In this game, there was both rooks were under attack. All of a sudden, pieces started being traded. And at the, like a certain moment there, Teddy was able to figure out a way to trade queens, then offer the rook trade and see that the king and pawn in the game would be winning. So he did a really nice job there. Lars, to his credit, he's been doing well on the clock. He's been outplaying Teddy in a number of different positions as well. So this match, it's one game lead for Lars Oscar Haug. It feels like it's a true battle. We'll return in a few minutes for more action from this I'm Not GM Speeches Championship match brought to you by Chess.com.
and we return. I'm pumped to be joined by my partner in crime, Grandmaster Amon Hamilton. Amon, it's a 4-3 lead right now for Lars Oscar Haug, but we're getting into the quicker time control. So now that we're here, what would advice would you give each player? Well, uh, first of all, what's up, Robert? Hello, everybody. Bringing uh, a new meaning to the phrase, better late than never. So <laughs> good to be here and uh, pumped for this match, which is very close right now. Teddy, I mean, keeping that score 4-3, um, you know, as we, we concluded the five-minute portion, I think is already a, a good sign for him going forward. I mean, we, we all know what kind of a beast Lars can be in the bullet portion, but just to have this match uh, within reach right now, I think if you're Teddy Coleman, you're feeling pretty good. Yeah, especially after being down four games to one, winning those last two games, he must be gaining some confidence, feeling like he can do this thing. And now that we get into the three minutes, a whole different ball game. And we just remind everybody that this match will continue here with Coleman and Haug. But let's remind everybody what happens on Tuesday, because on Tuesday night will be Gotham Chess, International Master Levy Rosman taking on Eric Rosen. That's Tuesday, 6 p.m. Pacific time. Aman, I know we're not doing predictions for that match yet. We're still in the midst of this one, but... Any uh, kind of thoughts about what we'll see come Tuesday? Man, that that is sort of a heavyweight streamer matchup. Um, you know, I, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, very firm takes. You're not going to say, hey, uh, you know, I just want to see a good match. I think you're going to see a lot of people very decided. You know, I want Levy to win. I want Eric to win. Um, but that's, that's going to be a, a pretty exciting matchup. Can I call that one? I'm not sure I can. Uh, on paper, I feel like Levy should be the favorite. But, um, you know, if, we, if we've seen, you know, his match against James Canty, for example, um, it all depends what kind of shape you're in on match day. That's true. And, well, match day is here, and we have moves. We have F4 for the second time from Lars. And, Amon, this bird's opening, I said, it's, doesn't, it's not seen very regularly. It has its flaws. And I think that's one of them is if you get your bishop to C5. Teddy last time put his bishop on D6. But these dark squares on the king side can be vulnerable. And it's such a weird concept because in chess, it's like you play the bird as white. It's like, hang on, isn't this just a Dutch with an extra move? It's, it, it never makes sense to me almost that I rack my brain. I'm like, wait, why isn't this good? This should just be a, an opening that's normal for black, but with an extra move. So I don't know. Can you explain that phenomenon, Robert? I guess the Dutch is just that bad. <laughs> you even get an extra tempo and it's not doing you any favors. But look at this. I mean, it seems like Teddy's playing a straightforward game. E5 coming next. The queen is on E2 here in harm's way. I like black's position. Yeah, agreed. Um, basically skipping the C pawn um, in Teddy's position. The, the pawn doesn't need to be on C5. He's chosen to play knight C6, bishop C5. And it's not often that, that normal that you play knight C6 in front of the C pawn uh, in these structures. So uh, I like it. You pointed out he's going for a quick E5. And if E5 happens, keep in mind, there's not going to be you know mass captures followed by D4 forking. Uh, because that would be pinned to the queen and the king on the e file. Wow, an e4. Talk about a move that I could never play with my <laughs> king in the center. There wasn't even a threat of pawn takes, I don't think, because the e file right. opening up would favor uh, black there. So uh, instead, we see bishop g4, c3, that takes away the d4 square. e5 remains a big possibility for black. But Aman, I see the e file bar. How does black prove the advantage here? It, it's a great question because honestly, I, I think it can be very tricky. Sometimes it requires a uh, move like e5, but I was actually going to say, Robert, after the move e4 hitting the bishop, maybe then it was time for e5. Kind of a weird move, but maybe the only time that you could have punched that in because now, see the difference, you play e5 later, f5 happens, and white's looking to kind of close things down. Right. And a5 play here, but there must have been something quick here. Maybe there's like a knight d4 sacrifice at some point because... I'm helped by that. I see the eval bar going crazy. So there yeah. must be some tactic here. And knight d4, just taking back with the e-pawn and going after the e4 pawn. Maybe that's something. Uh, what else can be played here? There's just clearly a tactic. Now it's about putting it together. Right. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I'm also looking at, like, bishop takes f5. Like, if you force me to play something tactical, maybe I'm trying to play bishop f5, e4, just sort of jam that pawn down your throat and, and bring the knight to e5. Because remember, white can't castle either. So it's not like the very next move, white is just going to be uh, safe. Right. And easy for us to say because we see that eval bar going crazy. The players have no idea. And queen yeah. b8, trying to go queen a7. And this king still can't castle, but now you have to take on f3. He does so. Bishop takes back. And this king doesn't need to castle. No, king f1, king g2. And watch out for these pawns storming for white on the king side. 
Yeah, I, I, if this hasn't already done this, I can see this completely turning around um, because this looks like a G4, G5, as you mentioned, uh, pawn storm that I don't see a good way out of. I actually really like that maneuver, queen B8, queen A7, quite creative from Teddy, but I kind of question like what the threats are for, for Black. And that's so annoying when you play, look at all of Black's pieces on reasonable squares, including this queen. And yet white has this advantage because Black has no plan, at least none yet. And one of the deals here is this pawn on C3 takes away such important squares from Black's yeah. pieces. So how to continue, maybe knight to B6, trade off white's knight on C4, that could be an idea. But I just don't see an actual plan. I see some moves, but nothing that says five moves down the line. This is what I like to see from Black's point of view. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And in Blitz Chess, I think what you brought up is exactly what makes this so hard to play um, with the black pieces is that having a plan versus not having a plan, usually the guy with a plan in Blitz Chess is, is going to be happier. Queen A6 played, adding some pressure to the knight. And you mentioned knight B6. He might be intending it now that he can maybe get the queens off uh, you know, with the same idea. Yeah, because these pawns do look menacing, where if a timely f6 or g6, the king on g8 could be in trouble. So without the queens on the board, then right. there's no checkmating attack. But white still has the space. Black can't actually have a counter shot. That's the big problem. I'm still looking at knight d4, even though I know it shouldn't work. I'm <laughs> that frustrated to have black's position here. If my pieces yeah. are stuck. Yeah, no, it, it is super frustrating. You know, keep in mind that structure because pawn on c3, look at how much work it's doing. Bishop on c5. Knight on c6, none of these pieces can, can join the action. Um, and bishop e3 played. Oh, okay. <laughs> not a fan of that move at all, Robert. I was looking at knight d4, you know, like you, you went bishop e3. I was already talking about knight d4, so the peace sacrifice came with a little bit of oomph, but I yeah. get it. We're here. Knight can come to c5 now for Teddy, and perhaps he should have played knight to c5 even before trading queens, because then the knight was coming d3 with check, and there's the b3 mm -hmm. square, and all this stuff is hanging. But yeah, it's still knight to d5 for Lars, and he says, "What's your knight doing? Mine's better." Yeah, I mean, can't complain about a knight on d5 um, if you're Lars in this position. But keep in mind, even though we have traded queens, that's not necessarily the end of the attack. I mean, you can still launch a pretty serious attack uh, without the queens on the board. H4, H5, H6. Um, and, and, and that king is going to be, there's going to be some questions asked to that king, and in the end game, there's going to be some pretty dangerous pass bonds uh, for Teddy to deal with. Absolutely, and that's why Teddy brought his knight back to e7 and put his pawn f6, and I don't want you to start pushing your pawns. The king is open. You made this point that the king is not fully safe here. You can't even bring your king to f7 because bishop h5 would be a very nasty check, but trading yeah. off rooks, that feels like it helps black. Yeah, trades are good. Basically, if I feel like if he can solidify a position on the dark squares here, um, and knight g8, yeah, mm -hmm. is the, the defensive move. This is where you almost wish you could play checkers and go rook takes g8, um, and knight takes f6, but that tactic is not going to exist. And what, is Teddy turning this game around a little bit, Robert? He just stole a pawn. He stole the a4 pawn. Not the first time today we've seen Teddy take that pawn. And now black is up a pawn. White is trying to go bishop c4, take on g8. So Teddy says... Preemptively, let me go rook g7, pin your knight. And h5 was a big threat, which is why the rook went to h2. Yeah, you might laugh at the move rook h2, but um, it's a really good blitz move by Lars. He recognizes peace trades, especially the rooks, uh, is going to be Teddy's position is going to be super easy to play after that. And look at this. Teddy bringing the rook to d7, smart, bringing the king out of the corner. And now rook g7 back, if you want mm -hmm. to. You can just bring your rook to that open line. But there's no threat for white. You take over the c4 square by playing your pawns to c6 to a4 in this chain. And now Teddy's just taking over the board. He is. Um, the knight is mobilized from g8. Uh, oh. Knight to c4 is going to be really good. But careful about knight c5 to e6. That is what Lars is up to. Good call. Because then the king is not saving. Knight c5, rook g7, yep. knight e6. So you can't play rook yep. e7. You have to rook e7, but knight e6 was possible. Oh! oh that's the blunder. You called it, Robert. Oh! And the only place that that knight could go. Oh, and that's got to be just heartbreaking because Teddy was fending him off. But this has been a theme in the match. Time trouble has done him in. And that position, he was actually much, much better. And the eval bar was saying pretty much winning for Black. Yeah, the, the only thing about that game is, uh, I guess, if you're Teddy, you can't feel that bad because I, I think he'd be the first to admit that that was just not the right game for him. He, he could have punched in some tactics earlier, but 
uh, the way that game went, it actually felt like Lars was in control for most of it, hit a really good position. So, uh, you know, right when you got your chance at the end, you just had invested so much time to get there that you couldn't capitalize. And Teddy clearly worked on his response to the birds opening during the break because that happened once and now he puts Bishop in C5 rather than D6. If he gets yeah. another break to look at that opening, Lars <laughs> probably would, should not play that again because it was saying minus two, something like that. There were tactics flying that Teddy yeah. couldn't quite work out. Yeah, and Lars is going to know that it might be safe to play in this three-minute portion because, hey, you know, the, the guy is stuck in this match. He doesn't have time to uh, go look at the evaluation bar himself and, and check his analysis on that opening. That's right. And so we get a more standard <laughs> theoretical line in the Queen's game decline. The knight went from B8 to D7 to F8 to E6. And now it's like, wait, okay, it's here. What's going on? The good news about this knight is it helps for a C5 push and puts pressure on the D4 pawn because white wants to play F3 and eventually play E4 and get a big center. And yep. there's your push. Yeah, and F3 is usually an indicator to play the move C5, because if you play C5 first, you're still going to get that isolated pawn, but what uh, the, the black player wants to do is play C5 after F3, so the pawn on E3 is always a target. You say, hey, you want to take me on C5, establish your isolated pawn position as white, be my guest, but then, then you almost wish you could take the move F3 back, so uh, <laughs> C5 is well-timed there. That's exactly the case. If you take, then you also, while you're pressing the clock, you push your pawn back to F2, because then your pawn structure is safe. But with the pawn E3, taking on C5 is actually very risky. And even if black takes on D4 and you take back with the pawn, you're not unhappy about this at all. Your pieces are doing very well. And the D5 pawn, I was about to mention that, is there bishop F6 and knight takes D5? Yeah, the, there's, um, there's a move that Lars played. He played uh, H6. And uh, usually what I'm used to in this opening is that the knight actually goes to G5. Um, so that could have been a move that he maybe forgot or should have played earlier. It, it blocks that pin. And then if the bishop wants to trade for a knight, it takes on g5. So you don't get that f6 knight. Uh, I think you were right. That, that, that was a moment where you could have just taken a free pawn, I think. Looked like it to me and said Teddy drops the bishop back to f2, which we can't criticize too much because he's protecting this e3 pawn. And now he's playing this isolated queen pawn position. His rook is in the right place against the d5 pawn and behind it the queen. So a move like e4 is probably even possible here. Bishop f5 is a thematic idea. And he says, let's just play simple chess. My rook can come to d1 and I'll double against this pawn. But the e3 pawn, Aman, you mentioned it. I'm looking at it. It feels <laughs> like it's a sustained issue. Right. Yeah, we're, we're all looking at the same uh, pawn. I am not a fan of rook d2, rook d1. It feels a little congested. I think that maybe either knight b5, uh, you know, move ago, or just knight d4 needs, needs to happen. And there it is, knight to d4. And now if we capture, we both have ice of the queen's pawns. And can I capture twice on d4? I know it's risky, but the point is if I take with the bishop and you take, queen takes mm -hmm. is thankfully checked to the king because otherwise bishop h7 would turn the tables and the queen on d4 would be hanging. So I guess Teddy would play bishop h7 first and you take, and then this happens uh, after some kind of capture. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I can't do that. There's a queen on c2. <laughs> I was like, wait, why is the board not letting me do that? Yeah. There's well, a queen. Move is it here? <laughs> that uh, would have been the case. So uh, this is the type of idea which <laughs> can happen in this position. And that's why Lars said, let me backtrack with bishop to d7. And, and long story short, I think you're correct. Like that knight can be taken on d4, but from Teddy's perspective, I don't think he had another move. Um, sometimes you go knight d1 to cover that pawn. Sometimes your bishop is not on d3. So you can you know move some piece to d3 to defend e3. But the way the position was there, Teddy simply didn't have another move to defend the e pawn. So he probably said, ah, maybe knight d4 loses a pawn, but hey, it's my only option. Let's play quickly. Yeah, the thing is, when you get rid of that pawn, your bishop on f2, which would have landed on d4, comes to life. So it was a very good, worthy pawn sacrifice for legitimate compensation. And Lars didn't take it, especially look at his clock. He's now down to 45 seconds. And that would have been way too easy for white to play and difficult for him to play. But this position still remains hard for black. Bishop f5. There's no direct threat. e6 is defended. d7 is defended. But every single decision, like, do I take on d4? Is that committing and helping uh, white in some regard? He says no, yeah. and we get this position. Yeah, um, and pawn on d4. The thing with about these rooks is that the reason I wouldn't necessarily double them is because of what is about to happen right now. They don't look that good on the d file. I mean, hey, that pawn's defended, but 
the bishop on f2 would be sufficient. So I, I think it's just sort of unnecessary firepower on the d-pawn, and you almost want to just shift them one file over, either to c or the e-file, so they could be on, uh, you know, somewhere with a little bit more scope. Absolutely. So the rooks are free to move. D5 can't be captured because the rook will take the queen and then this rook is hanging on D2 with the bishop mm -hmm. here as well. But sometimes you can get walk into a, what looks like a devastating pin, but your knight can move. But now queen A5 is really good by Lars here because if he takes on C3, that's a backward pawn. This knight can come to B6, give me the C4 square. I'm starting to like Black's position. Agreed. Uh, I think that uh, that's a nice little maneuver. Uh, queen a5, using the pin, giving a bishop for knight. The knight is going to make an entrance on c4. Uh, I do not think that there's any issues here for Teddy, but I think it's the type of position that could trend in uh, you know Black's direction here very quickly. Just the knight against the bishop is, is something that you have to be very conscious of. And Teddy's h3, he says, uh, is that a pawn for me or does he have some tactics planned? He wants to go rookie a check, but after king h7, queen b1 check, it's queen c2, which I think right. he probably overlooked. Right. And yeah, this not, looks powerful. Yeah, now you have to take and play rook to e7. At least you win back uh, one of your pawns. But this queen e1, that doesn't look right. That doesn't look right at all. You drop um, a2. f7 is hanging and some right, sort of bishop g3. Uh, oh, the bishop's hanging as well. Is yeah. there a perpetual? I don't think so. The knight is too powerful here. It takes the c8 square, so you get a bunch of checks, but there yep. should not be a perpetual. Yeah, and always remember, you know, queen e6, king d8, queen d6, knight d7. The knight covers every single checking square. It's just a really, and you, we're about to see it. Um, there you go. You can't check anywhere here as as white. No, you cannot. And what's the material count? It's a piece for just one pawn, and this a pawn is likely start going to start pushing and becoming a queen. But still, I don't think black's fully out of the woods. We know that black should win this game, but whenever yeah. your king is susceptible to checks, blunders happen. Yep. That's a good point. Queen a8. Um, lots of plays here. Queen f5 guards the pawn and threatens queen takes f4 with check. It makes a lot of sense there. Mm -hmm. And not that many pawns remain for black. So if you lose your a5 pawn, that and especially if you lose your, both your a5 and b7, that's not going to happen. But then, oh, it, down goes a5. That's one. Yeah. And now here come the checks again. <laughs> yeah, that knight is so powerful. But uh, king f5, I think queen, that's the right queen type a5. of move. Queen oh, d5, queen yeah. so strong. And then that's that, right? This pawn is just pushing, and okay, seven seconds for Lars. G4, yep. you gotta start pushing your pawns, but it's too slow for for White here. You can't play h4, you drop this pawn, so your pawns are stuck. That's the killer. That's the killer. You cannot touch the h pawn, so all the pawns are immobile. And uh, wow, big big result there as Lars steals the the first couple of games here in the uh, the, the three minute portion. Yeah, and they've been really close. They've been nail biters. But in that one, Teddy, I guess he didn't really sense the danger. I was complimenting him in the first time show for his ability to recognize transitions. Of In yep. this case, it was Bishop taking that knight on C3, and Lars was the one who capitalized. But in the five minute, it felt like Teddy was the one who was trading off, simplifying in very powerful ways. So right now, Lars, he's looking like he's in charge of this match here, and he goes back to his birds opening. Even if some of the games, the positions have been a bit shaky, he says, this is my trusty weapon in Blitz. Yeah, and the thing about this, uh, the way he's played this time, uh, his king's not on e1, and he's not threatening a quick e4. So um, he hasn't put his queen on the e-file, and his king's no longer in the e-file. So now e5 does fall victim to not only maybe a loose bishop on f5 with the rook, but just taking and then following up with d4, which is, would be a fork. Right, which did not work when the queen was on e2 because the bishop would be able to take. But mm -hmm. Mon's point is good. The king is in the corner. The queen is safe. So this kind of tactic would, well, it would backfire for black. So Teddy's not going to play e5, that's for sure. If you play d4, which is somewhat tempting, you look at that bishop on g2, and it opens up on the diagonal. Right. So d4, you break on the position for your pieces, but you really, really help that bishop on g2. So I think that you have to time that correctly if you play it at all. Yeah, and, and I'm starting to wonder, I mean, it looks like an extremely good adjustment by Lars for something in the middle of a match, uh, you know, in the middle of a format. The last time that he played this opening didn't go that well, and this one suddenly looks a lot better. It does, but I'm looking at E5. <laughs> he went Queen E1, which makes E5 possible again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the thing about E5 is you have to tell yourself that your bishop on F5 being defended only by the rook on E5 is somehow okay. Um, and 
Teddy, Teddy's rationalized because we've been pointing out that d4 doesn't work because bishop takes. Right, that queen being on e1, it's on the wrong square. You wish that if e5 happened, your queen could go back to d1, but the queen's <laughs> here, and that's why chess can be a game of timing and things precisely. And right now, e5 is very good for the rook. It's winning that battle with a queen along the line. It's e3 square, especially if you take and the e file opens up. This knight can come to g4 later. I think that Teddy's just pouncing, and if you look at Lars, he doesn't look very happy. No, no, he's he's barreling down with the calculations <laughs> there. E5, I think you generally have to take this pawn um, after E5, but is he trying to con conduct a way to play like knight h4, f5, trying to keep it closed? I guess, and that does keep it closed. Uh, but then there's those d4 moves that we talked about. Hey, you called it, knight h4, hitting this bishop. So where does the bishop go? Yeah, it, it almost like... You know, if you go bishop e6, the f5 move is too too tempting, right? It's just going to happen immediately. Um, bishop g4, then h3 happens. So I was actually almost going to say this, but I, I, I thought I'd let Teddy do the honors. Bishop to c8. What do you think of that move? I like it, and I think you probably want to play a move like d4 now to open up the position for your pieces, and there he goes. D4 is played, but that gives the E4 square. And Lars loves this style of position where he can play G4, play G5, and that's yeah. what he's going for, even though it's not going to happen maybe for the next five, 10 moves. But this is the position where it's closed down and he can go what he considers for like a free attack on the king side. Yeah, I, I don't know um, if this is a position that Teddy wants because that bishop on C8, it can't develop. And the knight on D4, can always eventually be kicked out. Queen f2, c3. Um, and g4, g5 is such a quick, easy plan for, for white to initiate. Bishop on e4 is a hero. It stops black from playing e4, which opens up the board. It covers the diagonal, hits b7, protects d3, protects f5. And as we're saying, g4, g5. But if you play g4, maybe there's a quick knight to d5. And that hits the bishop, gives you the f4 square for your knight. So you have to be careful about these decisions. And I didn't like taking that bishop, honestly, because the rook on a8 suddenly... It puts pressure on a2, but it also can maybe get into the center of the board by lifting up the a-file. Yeah, I think at some point Lars is going to have to invest into a move like a3 um, just to play it. Uh, the rook from a1 will swing over to e1 or d1, um, and we might see the move a3 right away, actually, followed by uh, maybe rook a to e1, and then he's going to uh, try this kingside stuff. Rook a4. I'm trying to figure out, is there at some point a threat of rook takes e4? He says, no, not for now, but bishop takes b7. It doesn't attack the rook in the corner, so you can play c6 and trap the bishop there. So Teddy quickly playing bishop c6, applying pressure on the e4 square. This seems like a good way to get out of things. Yeah, and if g4 happens, there's always a long-term idea, like, hey, we have to move the bishop, but bishop c6 followed by knight d5, and then on d5 gets into f4. So I was thinking something like g4 for white, knight g2, to watch over the e3 and f4 squares, um, and then h4, g5, just you know, send send the uh, the, the king side pawns. And well, Lars starts the queen c2 to attack the rook on a4, so bishop c6 would not have been possible because of the capture. So that's why Teddy puts queen on a8. And is he lining up some kind of bishop c6? And if you take to take with a pawn and then play c5, like is the queen well like placed? That. <laughs> that's yeah, <laughs> that's weird because if the king was on g1, you could almost play bishop oh, takes b7. F5 was hanging. Oh, Teddy, wow. Teddy didn't notice the difference. Like, Lars played a move, and Teddy was responding yeah. instantly with bishop c6. He's learning about you know his time trouble. He needs to play quickly, but he could have taken the pawn, and now he's moving slowly again. And if his rook d8, which is good, keep the tension and maybe go after this d3 pawn. This looks good for black. Agreed. Uh, the rook is going to slide over. We might see queen e2 followed by rook d1 mm -hmm. um, to watch over the d pawn. White needs to do something, but as soon as g4 gets played, that f4 square is looking juicy. That's true. Uh, is Teddy really trying to play c4 here? That seems not great. So he plays knight to e7. All right. And how does he continue? Queen b5. Where are the pieces going? Where do they belong? I, here? I don't know. I don't know. The rook on a4 looks so strange here. It does. But the queen on b3, surprisingly a good defender, helping the king because the queen can drop back to f7 at any moment. Mm -hmm. And 10 seconds for Teddy. He needs a move. Yeah, and he, he knows that knight wants to get to f4, but g4, g5, when the, the time pressure is on, that's the scariest thing to see. And the thing is, the black king's in trouble, right? So knight takes f6 check, but then Teddy may have a quick counter against this king on g1. It just feels yep. like white is dominating right now because this is such an important pawn in the position. Agreed. And that's mate. 
That's just such a strong move. It stops queen f7. Really, really good one there, queen h5. Have to play rook g8 and king f2. Wait, that king? There's no checkmate for white, and suddenly this king is in trouble. Yeah, and the rooks are basically stopped by these connected pass pawns in the middle of the board. Knight, knight g6 with tempo. Take this. Take ah, The pawns are all falling, though. But knight comes to f4. Wow, what is happening here? Knight f4 with check. Don't mind if I do. Okay, queen. I don't know where the yeah, queen Yeah, exactly. Queen somewhere. We need the queen involved. <laughs> yes. Knight h3. Oh, knight h3 is coming. I guess there's some sort of checkmates you have to watch out for. The bar is just going up yeah. and down with every Seesaw. single move. And queen d4 check, king h7. Where's the wind king up to h6? Oh, oh that pin. Pin. Pin's uh, pin everywhere. Is, oh, no. Pin is going to seal it. Just take it. And if you want, just make, make b4, a4 happen, something like that. Yeah. You need a pass pawn. Um, there it goes. He's going to play c5 and a4. Wait, so but if a4, you play c5. So here, king e4, now c5 win. Wait, c5, b5. What? So a4, yeah, a4 Dude, wins. Yeah, a4 wins. King d4. Wait, it didn't like to just take. And then black spawn queens too. And it's check. Oh my oh, goodness. Oh my gosh, <laughs> check. So black is up a pawn, and this king is super advanced, which should help in an attack against this king here. What the heck just happened? Both players have the same calculating look right now. The hands on the forehead. Neither one of them can believe what the hell is going on. I mean, I certainly can't. And queen e2, queen b1 check. Okay, queen back to e4. I like the queen on e4. Then king. Yeah, king yeah, would... exactly. What just happened? Oh my goodness! Bring the king maybe to the queen side. Yeah, I, I kind of like this. You want to try to push that pawn. Here we go, king c4 finally, and now king c3. Now if you just check, you block with a check. Those counter checks nice. are really important. Nice. So c5. Nice. Here comes the pawn. C4. Check on a3. King. Okay, check your king d3. King e3. Just keep running the king away. <laughs> you can push the pawn. Gosh, uh -oh. the pawn's a shield. And this, a this is really good by Teddy. Yeah, this is a very impressive play. And now, where's the win? Feels like it's right there. Maybe I would throw an h3. He does. Like it. Because this king is in a mating net almost. Queen e3. Check. Queen e3. Oh, check. It's check. Queen e3. <gasps> he missed it. Oh, my. Wait, it's still made. Oh what a God. find. What a find, my Lars. That was amazing. I did not. I did not notice that. And that is exactly what you should be looking for. He missed queen d3. Check. But Lars, so, so astute. How did he see that? Oh my gosh, this queen e3, it takes away all of these squares and g2 is covered. So what a find because queen d5 check, Teddy had to play check here, which forced the queen trade, wins the game with his pawn. Instead, he sees no squares for my king. And that is a stalemate trick if I've seen one. What a swindle at the end there. Oh my goodness, Robert. He... The thing is, he had to play queen d5. What a wild, wild game. I mean, he there was queen d3 winning for black, but that's just uh, full credit to Lars. And we saw the little golf clap at the end by Teddy. He was even appreciating um, what, his, uh, what his opponent was able to do there. Well, the players are going to take a quick break. They will try to wrap their heads around what just happened. We don't know. But we also will join them in that break. We'll return a few minutes for more in this three-minute plus one-second increment time segment of this match between International Master Teddy Coleman and International Master Lars Oscar Howe.
And we are back, ready for more action in this three minute plus one second increment time control between Teddy and Lars. Aman, that was a wild final game we saw and just got to give credit to Lars for spotting that stalemate trick. Yeah, and, and I mean, credit to both players. That was just a really exciting game because I thought Teddy was down and out. I don't know how he made a comeback. To, I don't even know how he got a queen on the board, Robert. Let's be clear. Uh, but both sides got a queen and then Lars with basically time taking down and I thought all hope was lost. He plays queen d1. Initially, I'm like, wait, that's a mouse slip. And no, that is far from a mouse slip. That is a completely sick idea. Yeah, well done there by Lars. And you're right, that he actually has outplayed Teddy in these structures where the king side is frozen. White has a pawn in f5. He's been launching his pawns forward very well. But right. Teddy kind of held him off well, and then it got wild. Teddy didn't have time. So that game is sort of the match. It's a microcosm for the match at large where things just get crazy. And Lars comes out on top, or in this case, he survives a position that as it wasn't going his way at that point, but really just credit to both players for the fight that we've seen. Yeah, and we've seen a lead uh, as substantial as the one we currently have. So six and a half to three and a half for Lars, but uh, you know previously it was 4-1, Robert, and, and Teddy mounted that comeback at the end of the five-minute portion. However, we're going to need to see, I think, the exact same thing from him in the, uh, the three-minute portion right now if he wants a chance in the bullet. And Lars going back to this kind of delayed Benko's Gambit type of position. And there's a knight on e2, which may seem strange, but if this knight does come to g3, the e4 pawn is extra well defended. So Teddy has a choice here. He, of course, can take on a6. His bishop can take back, and then we'll see a bishop trade. But the tension remains, and this is what we saw in the longest time control. Right. And uh, I kind of like the the idea of uh, this delayed, um, delayed Benko, I guess. Um, knight on g3 is, is never the best piece against, you know, the g, g6 pawn. Uh, can't really move anywhere. It's mainly there to defend the e pawn. So uh, I, I think this is totally fine for, for Lars. And it's kind of an offbeat opening that uh, seems to play into his play style a little bit more than Teddy's. It's going to be a wild game. Although I think Teddy did study this because in the earlier game, his knight was an F3 and Lars broke with E6, which he's doing once again. But the mm -hmm. big difference is you can take on E6 and you feel good about your E4 pawn. Of course, the right. thing that Black would try to do is play, you know, you take with a pawn and play D5. But I'm worried about these two pawns and Teddy goes for it right away. And I see the eval bar just six. It says, I hate that move. <laughs> uh, it looks reasonable to me, but look at this. This bishop, oy, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> the move e5 is such a natural move. Uh, I want to point out, first of all, like uh, it's the first move most people think of. You want to ruin Black's pawn structure and take a look. After d takes e5, that would be a terrible structure. Like doubled isolated e pawns, isolated a pawn, c pawn, like everything's a mess. But the, the style of the position that Lars has is, is that you can take a structure like that. You can play an active move like knight to d5. Um, and, and I think that this is going to work out tactically for, for Lars. And Lars is just, he's wide-eyed. He's like, well, did this really just happen? Teddy yeah. goes bishop c4, which I think is a good decision, all things considered, but he did it a bit s s more slowly than uh, you know I would want to do if I'm playing from the white side here. The bishop on c4 hits d5. It attacks the e6 pawn, perhaps with check behind it. But now I mean, this e3 bishop can be captured. I don't really care about the e6 pawn. g2 is hanging. Right. This feels bad. It does. It does. Because knight takes e3, it's like, if you want to throw in bishop e6 as a move in between, I think you might regret that. g2 is going to be hanging. And the only reason I take g2 is that you can't castle uh, ever, right? You don't have an a1 rook, and you're not going to be able to castle kingside. And on top of that, e5 is hanging. Queen h4 is coming up next. Queen e7. So I, I just, I can see this going really, really poorly for, for Teddy. Yeah, that e5 move, we understand it. You regret it immediately. And Lars quickly says, hey, that's a misstep there, buddy. And this bishop yeah. on g7, very powerful as well. The e5 pawn, it can take on d6 at some point. Or, well, not anymore because I just took it. But <laughs> look at that. The e5 bar dropped. And I'm guessing it's because it gives white a little bit of time. So Teddy can castle here if he wants. And it's not that he's out of the woods. His position still is a bit difficult. But now his king is safe. Yeah, no, that's a really important uh Really important thing to have the uh, the king safe means that Teddy can actually play the rest of this game. I was worried after knight takes e3, uh, f takes e3, that king would be stuck on e1, Robert, and just simply would never get castled for the rest of the game. 
And now it's safe and sound. If you do take on E3, I will certainly consider taking E6 with check. And mm-hmm. Queen A7. We saw a sneaky Queen A7 in uh, the match between Kostya and Tanya. It's like, well, wh- what Queen A7? Here it makes a lot of sense because I'm attacking your bishop, putting pressure on your knight. And that's why Lars just says, I'm going to develop and keep this tension in the center with his knight on d5 and everything staring at it. Yeah, I mean, you got these three pawns in the middle of the board. The bishop on e3 can always be taken. And he's sort of saying, look, if you want to save that bishop, go ahead. Uh, you know, this, the, the knight's pretty strong on d5. I could take um, on e3, but I don't I don't need to. You know, I have like ideas like knight uh, f4, like queen h4. And the knight on d7 might want to strengthen the center by you know, going, let's say, knight to b6 from d7 and attacking the bishop at the same time. Yeah, those knights are very powerful. And bishop h6 gained a tempo against the rook. And large says, okay, don't mind if I bring my rook up. The bad news about the rook being where it is is bishop takes e6 will pin and win that rook. So this knight on e4 is a bit stuck for the time being. But you mentioned knight to uh, b6 coming. Yeah, and I think maybe like knight takes c3 and queen h4 might have been a threat there hitting the, the bishop on c4 and the bishop on h6. So I think the queen is going to come out to h4 like pretty soon, or at least it looks like a natural square. But knight f4 is another really, really uh, a good move, aggressive move towards the king. Although this is a great response by Teddy here. He's keeping it complicated. Bishop takes f4 is a threat because the e6 pawn is not defended. This queen on a1 is actually well-placed to jump into the queen side if you're not careful, maybe a5, something like that to pin the knight on b6. Mm-hmm. And... I think it's suddenly more difficult for Black to play, even though I love this bishop on b7 and this knight on f4. What's the next move here? Yeah, that's a great point. I think Teddy is in a tremendous job in this game because I have pretty much never liked his position uh, the whole way through, and that's when it's hardest to play good moves. You mentioned queen a7. Let's keep that move in the back of our minds because queen a7 is going to really hurt Lars's position at some point if he's not careful. And he plays knight d5, which reinforces knight f4, which is necessary here to defend this e6 pawn. 12.9 seconds left for Lars. Teddy trying desperately to find a move. Is it knight g5? Is it bishop g5? He plays h3 just defending, and Lars quickly plays queen e8. The bar doesn't like that. Queen a5 taking advantage of the queen moving. So what's going on here, Amon? My goodness, I, I, it's really, really quick here. Um, I think we're just going to have to appreciate the, the calculation that these guys are, are putting in, uh, kind of shuffling back and forth by Lars, and every move by Teddy seems to have purpose. I really like what he's doing. So do I look, the rook comes in A7, the queen can come back to A5, and it feels like Lars's position is on the verge of falling apart. Yeah, he's shuffling. Every single move by Lars is like queen. His queen has moved like 10 times. <laughs> and the bar is just going... <laughs> It means that Black's position was fine at first, but no longer uh, is it approved of here. And what do you do? How do you break through for White? The moves that Tay's making look reasonable, and I don't know yes. that Rook takes F7, Queen A7 check. Yeah, Queen A7 oh, is gosh. great. Okay, but what's going on this diagonal? Let's connect five. No, connect six. Wait, Knight takes D6. What's possible? <laughs> Something like that. Oh, what's happening? Goodness. I have no idea. <laughs> the B6 oh, pawn man. is not quite hanging, but after Bishop to E2... It might be. Yeah, there, it dropped. And now the queen has to go, wait, e4 is hanging? Wait, they take a free piece! The, the 94 was hanging. <laughs> this is too much to take in here. It really is. Uh, knight f5. Knight c5. Knight c5. Take on e5. Ay! You got to see these tactics. Yeah. Oh, e5 is not that nice. Bishop g4 is coming. g2 is hanging here as well. And Ted wow. losing on time. d6 pawn was just hanging there. I mean, that's just. The pawn was the least of the things that were hanging in that time scramble, Robert. Oh, yeah, that's... (laughs) Those are just, you know, at the end of them, you're upset, you're annoyed that you lost the game, but you just got to be like, that was an utter crapshoot. We both had chances, like spinning the roulette wheel. Yeah, it truly, truly was. And the the fact that Lars is able to win the roulette spins as well as the ones where he's actually in control is why this match looks like it's more out of hand than it is. Yeah, that was such a weird game. The E5, as you're saying, looked logical, but then it got good for Black very quickly. But then Teddy was being resourceful, and Lars was shuffling, but doing so quickly. And then Lars like, somehow prevented Teddy from winning down the queen side. And then finally, yeah. everything broke loose, and Teddy lost in time when Lars did have the better position at that point. So, oi, oh. what is this, Rough. by the way? What, what are we walking into now? What's this pawns in G5? I have no idea. It looks awful. I'm just going to say, like, <laughs> straight up. Uh, the pawn on g5, there's no bishop on g7. The dark squares look really, really weak. Um, 
I was going to say, is that a mouse slip? But no, I guess it's not. Knight takes e4. And Teddy is uh, going. I honestly would have thought that Lars had the black pieces in this game because this feels like a more offbeat line that he would go for. But instead, Teddy is saying, I'm down by four points. I got to risk it to get some wins here. But now that Lars has castled, this rook is staring down at f7. You Oof. can win a pawn in c3. Have fun with that pawn. Your king <laughs> is never going to be safe. Yeah, I, I, it's very close to some sort of bishop takes e6, queen over to h5 type of stuff. Um, the, the knight takes on f2, hey, get rid of the bishop. But now the rook is actually ready to double up. As soon as that queen moves, rook over to f1. I mean, I think there's just going to be a bunch of sacrifices here. How does black survive if the knight goes to b6? to gain gain time and get developed that just gives white the e5 square and i i think this could be a really quick uh win for for lars i am not liking teddy's position at all no and bishop b5 played you mentioned the e5 square he says don't mind if i hop the pony right there real soon and I'm, i don't mind giving up my bishop for this knight if it gives me this e5 square so do you have to castle kingside? I see that. Oh, but like, a, but like a, this can't be right. You know, no, yeah. it can't be. But it's a, it's a this is fine meme. You know, I just sometimes you got to go for it. 95. Yeah, th oh, this is a disaster. So if you castle short, queen h5, king g7 to defend h6, f7 is actually hanging there, which is a really like weird concept because so you're, not, you're not used to the f file being open this early. Um, and oh, rook f8, that's like, you know, the beginner chess player that tries to castle and touches the rook first. <laughs> Although he wants to castle queenside. So if he gets one free move, he will be able to run his king to the other side of the board. And yep. what, what about rook? Is rook takes f7, rook f7, queen h5, but that's exactly it. Then you castle and get your king to safety. So there are tactics that look powerful, perhaps. And I'm, I'm castling right away. I'm castling. Yeah, I'm closing Go. my eyes and castling. Go. And the c3 pawn is under attack. Yep. And the whole thing can fall apart. Queen takes c3, queen takes d4. Uh, what is the thought process here? Yeah, I was going to say it must be queen takes c3. Otherwise, Teddy, is, he wants the castle, but I think he's uh, viewing queen takes c3 as, a, as an opportunity. Yeah, good inclusion. It says my king is never going to be truly sheltered, so at least I'm getting a pawn for my troubles. Once I castle, my rook is on d8, protecting my bishop. You can have the f7 pawn. I don't really care about that at this point, as long as my king feels mm -hmm. safe, and it will feel much safer when you castle queenside. And I think rook takes f7 um, is a consideration here. You can throw in that move to start um, because, well, he certainly can't take the rook back. And queen takes a1, there's like rook f1, check. Kind of a, a weird move. The queen on h5 delivers the check, and the rook then attacks the queen in the corner. So um, there, there is a rook takes f7 consideration, but a Teddy can always seemingly just castle out of that. Yes. And this rook is hanging. This pawn is hanging with check. Bishop e8 is even a threat here to pin the rook to the queen. It's like all these tactics could turn in black's favor. Right. And after rook d1, castles queenside, we see that the eval bar is saying, okay, white is a bit better. And that's typically scary when white's down some material, but knight f7 then says, nope, not good. So <laughs> it's funny because I, I don't even see how white's a bit better. This looks like it's falling apart and very shaky for, for Lars. And I don't know how Teddy did that. That was a terrible opening, but he might even be just better now. Wait, the rook's hanging? Uh, I, think, or... I think you spoke a moment too soon there. Because... Does he want rook takes f2, queen c2 check? Oh, okay. That's actually a good call. And so knight d8, rook f2, king f2, queen takes c2, and this rook is hanging. Right, and there's like no way to, to stop it. So bishop a4, very like intentional for that tactic, it looks like. Okay, so where queen e2 was played, and this rook can't go to e8 because knight d6 check. And if the rook goes to d7, still knight d6 check, uh, and your rook is undefended. Right. Yeah, that's, that is easy to overlook. <laughs> that is very easy to overlook because you think you're the one setting the traps, you know, getting creative with Bishop A4 if you're, you're one step ahead. But this is actually such a weird position. The rook just can't move. So you got to give it up. So I may have like Bishop C6, but the E6 pawn's also hanging with check. That's annoying. So make King B8. I, yeah. I don't really know where else to go. And Agreed. I want to put my Bishop on C6 at the end of the day. So he takes an F7. Rook takes F7. And... King B8. Yeah, so this is this is reasonable. I, I think if you were going to do King B8, you start with it, so the rook's still on F2 in this position, but not not really a big deal because, hey, he plays rook, rook F2 himself. 
So we're getting the position that we wanted after right. all. And the bishop on c6 is powerful, but it doesn't threaten anything thanks to this rook on f2. So I would just take this pawn. He does. H6 is falling. And Teddy puts the king on a7 so he can take on d4, which was not possible a move ago because queen e5 would have been a check. Yep. Um, I like what Teddy did, though. King is safe. He's got a blockade. And he can work on trying to take the pawns. You cannot let c4, d5 happen. Um, if that happens, the game's over. Yeah, it's an extra exchange, and it was one pawn, now it's even amount of pawns. But this could actually turn around. Let's say the queens yep. get traded, and this A pawn starts running. That is not the easiest thing for white to deal with, but queen to d3, bishop b5? You were saying you can't allow c4, d5. Yeah. to stop it. Oof, and this is going to happen. Like, I think, yeah, I think I pretty much said it. Like, c4, d5, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it kills that bishop's diagonal, and it was perched up nicely. Now I think this is just over. At d6, d7. You yep. just push it, and the bishop will have to sacrifice. Right? Yes. Yeah. Rook takes c4. All right. But d7 at the end still works. You have, you have rook yeah, f7 to win exactly. the piece. Or He's going to go rook back. It needs to be rook c8 here. Um, it's definitely a valiant try because you can play b4 and cover with the bishop. So uh, still in this game, and Teddy's They're making two a seconds. They both have yeah. two seconds. I didn't even realize that. Now there are two yeah. pass pawns. And whose pawns are faster? White is up this material. But this Black's is crazy. Eight, uh, before, 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 you gotta go. Two point eight seconds. Barely got that move off. King, king six. Up. Wow. Two point six to one point five. Two point five. King up what? again. Oh my gosh! The king is just going all the way in. Black's king? gonna win this. Oh no way. Bishop king. b five. <laughs> wow. What do you do here? The what is this? Who's oh winning? Oh my goodness. Who's winning and why? Bishop c four maybe. Yeah. Bishop d three. Okay. Bishop b one is an idea to take on h seven. Rook oh my god. What is happening? I have no idea. Queen? But the, I think the king is in king f6. Oh, this also works. You had a queen here. <laughs> Take on wow. g2. May as well. I would queen play d4, this. Queen d4 check. He's got a flag. Oh my god! <laughs> they won a time! And they both are just laughing. This is like the fifth time in the match that someone has lost in time. In this situation like this. <laughs> <laughs> he's going for the checkmate and he just loses sight of the clock it's <laughs> it's actually hilarious because rook takes g2 and suddenly as white you almost like you look around the board and you're like what the hell do i move here <laughs> he's like panicking he didn't, just literally could not pick up a piece and decide where to put it in the amount of time he had it's also a puzzle rush situation where you know you're completely winning, but you want to win instantly because you're playing in this time scramble. So he looks right. at the checkmate and then he doesn't find it and he's trying to figure out what piece to move, the rook or the queen, and he loses on time. Unbelievable. Wow. Unbelievable. <laughs> and Lars Lars was looking after that, like just stunned, like shell shocked. He was just like, What the what the heck just happened? Like he just got punched just in the face. He's like dazed and confused, but he's got to play the next game right away. So uh, Teddy, he's got to ride that momentum, Robert. If there's one way to come back in this match, it's wins like that. That is just bonkers. And we get, we get back to a position where you see the pawn e3, pawn d4 dynamic, and the knight's on g6 rather than on e6. So that frees up the bishop on c8, but it doesn't put pressure in the center. So I actually like this position better for Teddy than I did the other one. Yeah, and keep in mind the pawn on h7 is different from last time. It used to be pawn h6, knight e6. Now the pawn is needed on h7 to guard the knight on g6. So um, I would say, though, that Teddy's position is a lot more stable than last time. And I would, yeah, I was going to say, I would take on c5 before black has a chance to play c4. Yes. And well, especially with this b5 inclusion, you create some weakness. And wait a second, if you take on c5, can I move my knight? Knight takes b5 and win your bishop mm -hmm. there? That seems like a problem. Yeah, because keep in mind, there's like uh, ideas like knight c7 at the end of that. Um, for example, knight takes b5, bishop e3, knight c7. I think we win material there. Right. And he plays knight d4, which is a reasonable choice, but he wasn't thinking tactically. And just to go back a half step here, you were saying bishop e3, knight c7. That's a fork of the rooks here and white wins material. Yeah, that looks great. Um, bishop b6. And now Lars, I think... Uh, I still think Teddy's position is, is is totally manageable, but look at the ideas for Lars, knight e5, rook c8, uh, the c4 square, the e3 pawn. Uh, now I think this is, and I think the eval bar reflects it, is, is a much more even game uh, after knight b5 wasn't played. Yes, and the bishop on f1, it's white pieces are safe. The king is very safe over here, but if you're getting the feeling that white's playing a bit 
passively, defensively. And when right. I see this dynamic, I want to play a4, but of course I can't do that with the pin down the C file. So a4, not possible. How do I get to your isolated pawn? That's the theme of this opening. Do I bring my knight to e2 and the f4? It looks kind of precarious, honestly, by my e3 pawn is weak, but mm -hmm. there are times when you bring the knight this way. He plays bishop h4, losing sight of the e3 pawn, but gaining an attack on the d5 pawn. And uh, the first thing that I would think of is like, I have to get my queen out of the way. So as white, I want to move my queen. It just doesn't belong on a file where a rook is staring it down. Um, so whether that is to make the threat bishop takes f6 or knight takes d5 or both, um, you know, I'm going to need my queen out of the way for that. Or just to just to move my queen so that I can actually do something with that queen. I'm not sure from c2, it's the most operative. There is an idea maybe to throw it over to f2 and like g3. Um, queen to b3 puts pressure on d5. So I, I would look to get that queen out of the way, even if it's a move like queen b1. Well, that makes sense. And I think a problem for white is you need your knight in d4, but you also want it off of the d4 square. Because if it's gone from <laughs> d4, d5 is under attack. There are pins against this queen. But you need it on d4 precisely because of this e3 pawn, and it blockades the isolated pawn itself. So mm -hmm. bishop takes you. I like that decision. That's a good move to take that, and especially when you have to take with the rook. You couldn't take with the d pawn because you're walking into discoveries against your queen. So the rook takes, and that pawn is still here on d5 as a permanent weakness. Yeah, and it would be in moments like this where I would start to punch in um, a lot of moves from white. So rook d3, uh, I think it's very reasonable. Rook d1, I think moves like king h1, h3. I feel like there's a lot of these sort of wait, <laughs> waiting style moves. That's right, because the queen is stuck on d8. You do not want to allow bishop takes f6, where you take with the pawn. This queen may be important defending the d5 pawn. This bishop on e6 defending the d5 pawn. So for black, I want to play a5, b4, but then my b5 mm -hmm. pawn's hanging. So do I just play b4? No, he goes back and Teddy's moves are easy. Yeah, yeah, and this is uh, really important. We've seen uh, him come back on the clock and look at that move, king h8. Um, he almost wants to say, maybe g takes f6 is going to be a real consideration in the future. Do you think he's going to be moving this queen to d6 or something and being okay with those double pawns? And it might be an anticipation of queen h4, right? As it goes queen e7, and queen h4 still can be played, trying to take on f6 and double Bishop those pawns. d8, yeah. Oh, yeah. wait, why would you take that? Did he just forget the move bishop d8 was played? Because look Lars at Lars. Is, <laughs> yeah, he's like, what? <laughs> why would you take that? He's like, well, my bishop now is here, and that's all good. So, <laughs> yeah, this is just... I mean, it's not a blunder about, you know, by any stretch, but it's just like a funny decision to take you know, bishop for knight unprompted, especially when bishop d8 was you know the exact counter to that. Yeah, and Teddy's position is still good. We like the rooks. The pawn d5 is still a problem. Maybe knight f4 now uh, makes uh -huh. sense, but he's taking his time. He's being deliberate, but bishop takes f6. That's a move you want to take back. I think so. I think so. Um, just no matter what, he will probably want that back. Um, Lars is going to, yeah, I was going to say, bring the king to the middle, um, king to e7, and it's hard to add full pressure to that. What is he doing? Knight e2, maybe knight c3 ideas, but the counterattack comes with rook c2. Yeah, the bishop on f6, right? The bishop that he <laughs> gave up there, and now it's playing its role. And b4 is a good move, because yeah. a3 is a bit more difficult to get to, but bishop b2 could have been played there. It's a takes yeah. on d2, and now you can't get to this pawn, and d5 is under attack. Yeah, wow. Well, this looks like a... A miss if king d6, there's just e4 or yes. knight takes d5 in e4, um, and you're just gonna pick off that pawn. And so Lars says, Take me, I'm going rook c2 at the end of this. And Tay says, Okay, go rook c2, that's good for you. Brings right. the rook back to d3, protects here, but is bishop b2, no, bishop b2 walks into rook d2. So bishop b2 will not be black's next move, or it should not be. So white can play f4, king f3, and get yeah. on the pin. Big fan of f4, the reason being that the king is going to then access a light square, which stays off, you know, the dangerous uh, dangerous squares that you could go to. I think h3, g4 makes a lot of sense here. e4 loses immediately, and h4, I'm not sure I'm a fan of that. And oh, I'm definitely not a fan of that. You take with a pawn oh, no. and the king comes in? That was just a really pawn bad decision. Pawn or rook here, Robert. Do you do you take with the rook? I think I would probably take with, take with the rook. Yeah. Take with the rook and make a draw. He does that. Yeah. You go rook d8 and just start going around after black spawns. Yep. Seven seconds, though. And you got to move. He, and he's probably frustrated as well. Black can start, you know, after rook a8, go king d5, king c4, and just go for that win. And said oh. he, he backtracks, so rook b6 is now rook b7 check. And if the king goes to g8, maybe there's an opportunity somehow for white to play for more. And yeah, e4, I agree. Uh, uh, Wait, terrible move. <laughs> yeah, wait, I was like, what? 
Uh, mm. That's that's going to be, I think it's going to be a win for Black now. Um, still very drawish, but it just feels like decision after decision is not going his way. Oh, man, he put his king here, and this pawn's hanging. No, this has been many, many yeah. in incorrect decisions here. Yeah. Oh, oh with a pre-move. The pre-move. And Lars just laughs, and Teddy can't believe it. Well, oh, no, especially gosh. because in some ways, like, Rook takes f4 was the, <laughs> the easiest move to anticipate from Black. So Lars is probably like, yeah, you know, you're not sneaking that one by me. Um, he takes that one, that one back. And <laughs> Robert, uh, what a conclusion to the to the three-minute portion here, because I, I think we saw uh, a sign of hope, maybe, uh, on Teddy's side with that insane win on time. And Lars winning the last game in the segment just to, you know, make sure that things aren't getting out of hand. Yeah, and to make it matters worse for Teddy, he was up a clean pawn in that end game, right? He had yeah. an extra pawn that Bishop was the hero for Black, the one that he ended up taking on F6, and then the Bishop went to A1 and then took this knight on D4. So some yep. poor decision-making there, but also it's tough. You're in the middle of a battle. You're down three games. You need to win. You're putting pressure on yourself. And he did see that D5 pawn as a permanent weakness, so I get why he did it. Unfortunately for him, it didn't actually get him the point. In fact, he lost a game he really had no business losing. So for Lars, eight and a half to four and a half. Amon, before we take a break, what advice can you give the players heading into Bullet? Well, um, for Teddy, basically uh, play a little bit outside your play style, outside your comfort zone. Um, make decisions you wouldn't normally do. Uh, look to play as fast as possible, as loose as possible, and just know that you might have to shift up your play style to get wins because you need to make up a four-point difference. I like that advice. We'll see if Teddy heeds it. In the meantime, we're going to take our last break and we get to the bullet portion of this I'm Not GM Speech a Championship match brought to you by Chess.com.
just want to remind everybody that you can get involved. You can play in Arena Kings. Season six is well underway, Mondays and Fridays. Anyone can play. Only streamers can win, but it's a fun time. You can play the likes of well-known grandmasters, other streamers who are, you know, making their greatest efforts to take down those prize funds. It's been a lot of fun, Amon, has it not? <laughs> yeah, it really has. And I, I was just thinking because uh, Hikaru is playing in a tournament right now. Is this like, is this everyone's chance to maybe actually win first place for once? We'll see if he sits it out. He is playing in the Champions Chess Tour, but that's a good point. Maybe now I'm more encouraged to play, honestly. <laughs> exactly. There we go. Well, before we get to Arena Kings, of course, we have the final segment of this match. We have Teddy Coleman down four points against Lars Oscar Haug. You gave advice. You're saying what Teddy needs to do. He needs to mix it up, play quickly, get positions yeah. that are not expected. And for Lars, honestly, keep doing what you've been doing. You've been playing good chess. You've been finding the accurate moves in time trouble. And that's been, I think, the biggest difference in this match is throughout the games, it's been back and forth. But then we get to the time scrambles and it feels like Lars has had the upper hand. But then again, he did lose that game on time a couple right. of games ago, up a queen. Yeah, it's almost like uh, both players are totally capable of uh, losing on time, which is why I think that Teddy needs to be comfortable playing um, playing these crazy, crazy positions and trusting himself a little bit more. That's what Bullet's all about, instincts. And uh, we're going to see if he has what it takes, Robert, in the bullet portion, because if he makes a comeback in this match, it's got to be in the bullet portion, which is not where, where I think Teddy would normally expect to score his points. No, the position is so closed right now. And Bishop takes E5. You couldn't take with a knight because the pawn would have taken. And instead, we're just getting a series of trades. C5 is on the agenda here. I would push that, get my queen to B6. This feels like the type of start to a game that Teddy wants, but Lars, to his credit, he's keeping things closed. And how do you win a game from the black side of this? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, not only is it maybe a start that Teddy wants, it's definitely a start that Lars wants. He's got two bishops. I don't really see a dangerous plan for black. Of course, there's lots of plans, but there's nothing really that he has to be concerned about. So he can build this up slowly. Um, I don't think that, that Lars is going to be unhappy with what he's got in game one here. I guess in a sense, I have my classical chess hat on. We're like, black is doing fine. This is the exact type of position you want. You've neutralized white's opening advantage, but you're right in bullet. It's so frustrating. This bishop on h2 just sits here and covers the length of the diagonal. You attack yeah. my pawn on b2. I just protect it. Good for you. Uh, but I like this transition here. If you can get this knight to c4, maybe you can start causing some problems for white. Yeah, and that knight on d6, uh, of course, can be taken. But I think Lars is looking to keep pieces on the board. Uh, really like what Teddy's doing from a positional point of view, but keep in mind, while you're playing everything on the queen side, uh, h4, h5, and Lars is striking on the king side. And that's why Teddy brought the queen back. It, b5 wasn't really the main idea. It was allowed the queen access to the king side to help out. So queen f6, queen f5, offer a queen trade. The knight on c4 is very strong, but time is ticking, Amon. We've already spent two minutes on this game, and it looks yep. like a position that will last at least another couple. Agreed. Agreed. Um, queen f5 is a, is a good idea. And he is going to take that followed by, you know, ideas like h5, ideas like b3. Um, I think this is exactly what Lars you know, is looking for. Although from a tactical point of view, if you can get e5 in for black or maybe even g5, you feel right. like you're making progress in the position. The knight on c4 is a great piece. And tell you this, rook a8 and a3. Oh. <laughs> That's just a, it, it just hurts a little part of me there, Robert, when I see the move A3, basically giving up on B3 as a move for the rest of the game. And Teddy plays rookie seven. He wants to bring, oh, E5. I think you uh, have to play yep. E3-5. Yep. There and it is. There it is. And the king can even come to E6. Just this knight protects and attacks a great position for Teddy with the black pieces. Yeah, and I think he's like tempted by E4 here, but he's worried about how he wins the game after doing that because it's hard to find a break. Right, locking up the position, probably not great. So he goes rook c8, trying to go rook h8. And can I just win this pawn? Okay, now e4 ideas are tempting. He does it. He has a pass pawn protected by another. The knight on c4 dominates his bishop on c1. So how to win this game, though? That's the essential question. Right, I think I think it has to be g6. So the rook on d7, probably rook d8, rook g8, or rook h8, followed by g6. That makes sense. You need to break open this position because that's why, look at this. Rook on f2 and f1. You cannot play g6. Otherwise, you drop yep. this pawn. So maybe knight yep. d6 and reroute the knight. Oh, rook f1. Oh, he doesn't play it. But this is great for Teddy. He now has an, yep. a rook protecting and attacking. g4 is falling. So you can take it, but then rook takes f6 and rook takes f7. That would be blunder. He starts with king e7 for that reason. 
I think we just need to guard the pawn. Um, okay, take on g4 is possible now, but I was thinking like knight d6, knight e8 almost. And he just trades. He says, my pass pawn is too strong. This and if the rooks trade, this game is over. Oh, yeah. And even if the rook's on the board, this knight comes to c4, and the king is cut off. Ooh, rook f6. Great Knights. move. Yes, well done here. Rook f2, e3, rook e2. It doesn't quite work. So he checks the king to h off rook g1, bring that rook around to b1, and thank you for your b pawn. Yep. And so keep in mind, that pass pawn is still going the distance. Oh, no! That's a rook blunder! Oh King f5? Wait, Continue to play the game? <laughs> are there still chances for black here? I think there's still chances. It's just crazy black is better. Say. The eval bar says black is better. How is that? Oh my gosh, e2 is coming. What? And then. 94? Take knight c4. Take a3. And then oh knight c2. Oh my god. And then knight c2. Knight c2 and the a3 pawn. Oh, he had to put knight c2 in the push of a pawn. Oh my god. Knight c2 would have been nuts. Wait, he's still in this no, game. Rook a1. Rook a1. And it's just not in time. One move too slow. You should resign. You gotta get the next game going. Oh my goodness. That's how dominant his position was. He blundered a full rook and he still he gave up an entire rook <laughs> and was actually still winning. That's that's <laughs> insane. That's hard to do. That is hard to do. And we get a new game here. Lars now up five points and playing this kind of like Dutch-like position in the English where you play pawns f5 and e4. And this knight on h4, it'll continue to apply pressure on this pawn on f5. Yeah, I was going to say, after d3, I've seen some lines where they take on d3 and you just go bishop g2. Like, you just, or bishop h3. Like, you're just going quick, quick development. Um, so, and I almost think you maybe need to play in a little bit of that style. Uh, maybe not that move, but that style. Because another game dropping is just, it's not like you're one game away from, you know, uh, one game further away from the result you want. It's, it's even more than that. It's the time invested in that game as well. So he really has some ground to make up. Definitely. And the knight comes back to G. And what, Lars is playing the most passive position, but he's like, come on, man, beat me. Show yeah. me that you can win this game. And it looks terrible for black. This knight can come to D4, into C6 or E6, things like that. If you take on D4, well, then you, I get the whole diagonal. Knight F4, knight D4. One of these knights has to move into the position, but Teddy's spending time and he only has just under 19 minutes to catch up. Yeah, I, I really think knight d4 from f3 was was the way to go. You should try to avoid trades a bit as um, as Teddy here because Lars does not have a lot of squares to put his pieces. I would go knight g5 and say, take one of my knights, but then my bishop on b2 shines. So I said he doubles in the e-file, also looks good, but knight g5 is what mm -hmm. I'm looking at. And if knight e4, are you uh, considering sacking, moving the queen? I'm surprised knight e4 hasn't been tried yet. Well, it might happen now just to close on the e-file and try to win this e6 pawn. So not a fan of that. Bishop takes f6 and knight to d4. Protect your mm -hmm. pass pawn. Put your knight here. The knight can come to b5 and that rook is in danger on a7. Yeah, This bishop is so strong on g2. Oh, knight b5. The rook has to go to a6. There's also knight c6, which forces the blockader away. Ooh, I like that. So knight c6 is still probably good because you can't take on e6. There will be a bishop d5 at the end with a pin. Yeah, big fan. If you want to play, oh, knight d3. Okay, maybe it's not a big deal, um, but knight d3 is there. But now the queen will replace the knight, and it's hard to dislodge the. Oh. Okay, he finally placed knight d3. Yeah, it's like a, it's about time, and yet white still has a pretty decent position. But, but how do you win this, <laughs> dude? This is like the theme. Teddy is look at that rook on a7, Robert. Teddy's just blundering material and still winning. That's the theme. So how does he actually win this, right? Like, lots of shuffling. Run. Yep. I think you need to get your queen to d7 somehow. Like, bishop b5, queen c6, queen d7, but I don't think you have time to do that. Maybe, get, uh, I don't know. Bishop d5, okay, step one. Now, but the c pawn can move. The rook is out of prison if he wants to. Yeah, and he, Ta he takes that chance. But he gives up b6, and that's maybe not the most important pawn, but... Eight. Look at the time. That's a bullet decision, though. His rook is free. That's counterplay. And look at the time. It takes four seconds. Yeah. Rook e3. Or have to. And then rook d3, go after this d6 pawn. I feel like Teddy's position is good, but 3.8 seconds, not a lot of time, obviously. Yeah. Black can try to set up a swindle here, like some sort of uh, rook b8. Like as soon as queen f6, queen a1 happens, man, everything starts to fall apart. Yeah, the queen is an e7. Like that's the move you want to play. We have the pass pawn, so king h3. And... Oh, no, he lost the pawn. You what? need that thing to win. That's the one you needed. 
And it's still fine for Teddy. <laughs> <laughs> it's still good. Bishop D7. Bishop D7. Bishop D7. Oh my gosh, the rooks were in line they with one another. They couldn't defend each other. But C6 is pawn is still great. He's still winning. <laughs> C7. Push that thing. Push it. Keep pushing He's it. Still winning. <laughs> Wait, but no, the other rook takes and the A1 queen. Oh my oh, god. No. <laughs> okay, now he's lo losing actually, but it should be a draw. Um, yes. Terrible result though, because this is going to be played on for a while. Just go bishop e6, bishop f7. The king is actually yeah. caught in the corner. Yeah. Well, this game is going to continue for another yeah. minute. I would play g5. Yeah, exactly. Okay, g5. I would actually play like 49 moves and then play g5, but yeah. to each their own. <laughs> yes. And Teddy should throw in a g7. Like if he anticipates a pre move <laughs> and he's still not losing if he plays g7. So the bullet thing to do is just play g7, hope that Lars is pre-moving on your queen. The problem with g7 is that um, didn't they repeat that position like 20 times, by the way? Um, yeah, about, about the problem like the problem with g7 is that if you play it and your opponent catches you, he's no longer gonna give you a draw. Like right. if I if I catch my opponent trying to get me with a g7, it's like, okay, hang on. We're playing like that. Well, enjoy the next 150 moves of this game. <laughs> that's right, because a 50 move counter starts again, and then you yep. make another pawn move, starts yeah. again, and that's a problem. <laughs> so we do have this um, London type setup thingamabobber, but then F3 and G4, so it's like the Jabawa London. Yep, exactly. Jabawa London, the, the idea is a very quick kingside expansion. And you know you play like Bishop D3, um, Knight GE2 or Knight H3, and then into F4. Right, and if that Knight gets to F4, that Bishop doesn't feel very comfortable. Even on G3, it's strong. You play H5 at any moment, you castle queenside. That's what white's going for. But this is the type of position you probably are happy about if you're Teddy, because you need to win games. So yeah, at least absolutely. there's double-edged nature and C5 is coming. Mm -hmm. No, this, this is a, a good position to have um, for the match situation. You mentioned long castling. That's the idea. But first, E4 and taking the space everywhere, it seems like. He's playing in the center. He's playing on the king side. And Teddy does not want to castle on the king side. <laughs> so he castles long and this D4 pawn, a long-term potential weakness. Knight b6 come into c4. Mm -hmm. Okay, I pop that pony right into c4 because rook d7, rook d8. He's playing this pretty well. He is. I also like the move g5 for white. Um, take, take with the h pawn, rook comes down to h7, and that g pawn just kind of annoying and takes the f6 square away from black. Yeah, that's a good idea. And knight a2, he wants to go c3 to defend the pawn. I still want to play knight c4, but I understand the white queen will then just run over the, to the queen side. So knight c1. E5, not D5? Ooh, don't like this. <laughs> now the other knight goes to A7. Well, first a knight A2, <laughs> now A7. Yeah, because what's going to happen is C4. That is looking good. Knight D3, and I like white's position. Yeah, all of a sudden, white's making progress, oh, but the knight is the best locator. Oh, knight six. knight six. Oh, gosh, you saw it coming. Ugh. Yeah, and, and he, I think uh, E4 defended. Knight is great blockading on D6, but... You know, your damn material, this is not this is not enough. No. And queen d4, rook d2, nice move. Go after the king side pawn somehow. And then he's going after g4. And uh -huh. e4 still has to take that and take with the pawn, I think. I take yeah, at this point, like queen g5 is the more positional move, but I think you just had to take with the pawn and start pushing. Yeah, take on e4 with the... Oh, there's... Yeah, maybe you could take on e4 there. Yeah, I would take on e4. I would almost still take on e4, but knight e6. Knight e6, knight e6. That's... And that's, that's a full rook, by the way. And by the way, I didn't look at this, but Lars's bullet rating is 2,800 and Teddy's is under 2,400. So I think that going into the match, both players knew what would happen in bullet, that Lars is the heavily favored player. Yeah, and, and that's why I was saying when you're getting the bullet now, you know you're the underdog on paper. You're also the underdog in this match because you're down uh, going into this. I think it was four games. So you really just had to play totally outside your, your style and comfort zone um, if you wanted a chance. And that's what Teddy's trying for. He put his bishop on the long diagonal, but you don't want to block the check with your bishop here. And look, that's another check. If queen e2, there's knight takes d4 par probably. So yep. at least ideas revolving around that. So that's a bad thing. Oh, you, I take this, is bad. Oh, this is bad already. And Teddy's yeah. got to move his king to f1, I think. No, nah, that's no good. And Black Castle, so Lars, I mean, he's been impressive. I have to say that in the later portions of the three-minute and then now in the bullet, he's really just said, I'm taking this match. I am, yep. you know, 
I threw away a couple wins by losing on time. You threw away a couple wins by losing on time. But ultimately, I feel like I've been playing good chess. So let me take this match and not even let you back in it. And credit to Lars for sort of identifying a win condition. Um, he's done that in a bunch of his matches so far. It hasn't been like insanely impressive in five minutes. Um, but when it comes down to the end of the three minute, getting into the bullet, he really starts to turn on the Jets. And he knows he's, he's a very accomplished bullet player that he can, he can take home victories in that portion alone. It's true. And he brings his knight to h6 over here. Just saying no knight g6 for you. That could have been a problem for the king on h8. But now the king walks away. And Teddy's position, he stole a pawn. He has to take on e8. And so he's up a pawn, but the king on f1. That king yeah. is in trouble. And it's because the rook can't get in the game so easily. Bishop e4 after g3. Um, looks crushing. Although, do you have enough time to somehow? Yeah. Uh, knight f7 is strong. That's a problem. Very good move. Yeah, and got a sack for that. Yeah, you have the e6 square for your knight, but you're down in exchange, so. And, and just like, you know, the, the way that Lars plays bullet, um, he's up like 40 seconds. It's insane. Um, Teddy is just under in, uh, tons and tons of pressure game after game. He is. And Lars has been great on the clock, with the exception being those couple games that we've mentioned a number of times now. And Teddy, look at him. He just planted a knight on e6. And he's had his fair share of chances, right? He, yes. even when, as you said, he blunders and he's still better or still even. <laughs> yeah. He wanted a full rook in that bullet game. Yeah, that was, that was great. That was basically the, the, the pinnacle. I think B4 uh, by black needs to happen. There was Queenie one check to take on F2, and that's why Teddy Ooh. Ross came back up. Right. That's a good point. So they both. It's always it. annoying, eh? When you, when you notice your opponent's tactic and you're like, oh, man, well, that's not fair. They didn't see it. <laughs> Yeah, right. And this is still bad. Now, no extra pawn for white, an extra exchange for black, and time is coming off the clock. I think it's already too late. We're under 10 minutes. Yeah, that's definitely too late. And Lars, six-point lead. Is this match going to end with like an eight-point spread? It definitely could. I think uh, I think at this point, oh, 93, a tricky guy. Yeah, good effort, but drops another pawn. Mm -hmm. Rook F3 can happen, or Queen F3, and he just wins on time. Yeah, and he's, I think now is the reflection part of the, the match for Teddy, where he's probably thinking about all those like missed chances and flags and just things, games he wishes he had back. Yeah, you know what I hope? I hope we see just fun openings game after game. The match is already over. So we yeah. have a, you know, a King's Gambit type of position. Here we go, G5, G3, trying to break open this pawn structure. And this is a fun one. All right, I'm happy about this. Yep, and we have the Vienna. Uh, it is a fun opening, so... I think we're gonna be. I think we're gonna be treated to a good one here. Uh, the time actually is a lot closer. Let's look at Lars. He's staying close to a minute on the clock. He's just in the flow. He's yeah. un he understands these positions very well. Whether it was those games where he pushed his pawn f4 in first move, then later to f5, closed down the king side, and just put pressure on Teddy, or he has these gambit openings where he's having a lot of fun. He has been doing very well on the clock. Yeah, we can take on g5, but I was going to say that Lara's move is to castle. Um, don't even bother calculating that. Castle can be one knight d5 and start to, start to again, feel that flow, that bullet flow. You couldn't pay me that block's position here. You're up a pawn, but you can't move anything. Can't move anything. <laughs> and like it's d, terrible. D, uh, d5, knight d4, we know how these games go. h5 then is under attack. e6 is mine. f5 is mine. Here it comes. I think he's about to do knight d4, and as you mentioned, he, he's going to trade those light square bishops, and that's going to open up all those light squares like e6, f5, and everything for the taking. No fun, none at all, and you also will have a hard time casting queenside because your king will still be under attack once it gets there. Mm -hmm. So Lars is under half a minute, so is Teddy, about even the clock, but the position feels easier to play for white. Definitely does. Knight c4, though, um, mm -hmm. seems... Like a miss. Yeah, that hits the queen and the bishop is under attack a second time. You got to go knight c4. You really don't have any other moves. Yeah, because the king literally can't castle in either direction. So he goes king f7. It just wasn't, I mean, now a second time. Again? Yeah, okay. Both players are just completely overlooking that possibility. Yeah, yeah. Knight c4. Okay, there we go. He covered it. Yep. And that probably, when you see B3 happen, when you're playing this position, oh, come on. Why did you play B3? Because yeah, exactly. I had Knight C4. <laughs> exactly. And now Lars is locking down the queen side, and there's a king on G6, which is 
Not that on save, but three seconds. Teddy Knight making takes a move. E3, and then Queen takes A4 for the fans. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. The bishop on D8 is just doing a hero's piece of work here, covering F6, covering C7, but it's also just terrible. Look at Teddy. He's a rook H8, rook H7. He's like, I don't care anymore. <laughs> Maybe he'll play H4, you know? Maybe he'll try to get a pass pawn. <laughs> <laughs> He's literally shuffled his rooks for like every single move. <laughs> That's well, why, great. Why you just go king a3, pawn b4, trying to win on the queen side? Yep. <laughs> the thing is, this shuffling, you know, doesn't help the match clock. It's not like he's still thinking about winning the game, of course, but just funny that Lars is probably like, he, maybe he's not checking the match clock. He's like, oh, what the, what the hell? I'll do this strategy. And whoa, down goes g3. So whose king is going to be worse, Lovelson? The king on g6 is surprisingly okay. <laughs> Wait, there's two rooks hitting the b3 <laughs> pawn. Wait, knight of eight! Knight of eight! Oh Night my god, Knight of Eight! It's a forge! Huge. And does he see it? Oh, he, he finds it. it. Yeah. And he's <laughs> laughing at himself for like basically how long that took. Yeah, and Teddy's just like, what can a guy do? What can a guy do? <laughs> and we still have five minutes. And so let's just have some fun in the yeah. bullet. I'm hoping for Teddy's last game that he plays Knight of Six on move one and Rook G8 on move two. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> you yeah, think I'm you think point. I'm joking? We might see it. Is that, a, is that a Teddy special? It's not a Teddy special. It's something that I've wanted to try, and I mentioned it to Teddy. And so I think that if he you know, is in good spirits, he's having a good time, he might play Knight of Six for G8. This feels like a good spirits match. Like, you know, it's very competitive, but once both players kind of get in that zone where it's out of hand, I think it has been pretty uh, good, good spirits uh, the whole time. You know, even some of the blunders we've seen, it's almost like both guys are kind of laughing at the blunder when it happens on the board. Yeah, you, when you, you look back on this match, Lars deserves to be the winner based on what we've seen. And for Teddy, it's like, well, I was in most of these games and it's just, just a couple of things going my way. It's mm -hmm. much closer. So for both players, there's a mutual respect here and they're still playing some serious games down the stretch. This position here locked up. This Bishop on G7, very happy. The Bishop on F4, not quite as powerful. So I like Black's position. Yep, B6 is going to just say, you know, solidify the entire queen side. C5 square belongs to black. Um, you know, white has some squares, knight, knight on d4, knight on b5, but I, I agree. I definitely prefer Lars's position. And that A pawn is going to be picked up. And hang on, you're also threatening to win a piece with bishop d4. Yes, the bishop on e2, there was also forks on the b3 square. And now queen f6, you can win. The, oh, you can just take on b2 right away, I guess. But had that as a possibility. So he didn't take this pawn. I was. Yeah, maybe knight b3 to d4. Um, B6 is a, again, I, I would take on that B3, honestly. Yeah, <laughs> he does. You don't need to tell him twice to sacrifice material. And yeah. Look at this bishop on E2, just such a bad piece. This knight on yeah, C5. This is just good uh, chess as well. Like rook E3, it's literally a rook for a bishop, but believe me, in a classical chess game, some of the top grandmasters in the world would not only maybe consider that move, but probably play it. It's good for black. Knight E4 yeah. and knight G3 check. and Black is just better. White has no moves. You're stuck. Nothing to do. Take on f2. I like knight g3 and queen takes. Oh, you're, yeah. That's the you're way. an evil, evil man. <laughs> That's the way to do it. e3 is hanging. b2 is hanging. Pick which one you want. This makes sense. And Bishop d4 is about to win the game. There it is. That's game. Yep. So will Teddy play knight f6 rook g? That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> Yeah, this next game is his chance. There's no way he thinks of that at this time. That would yes, be nice. yes, he will. <laughs> Have faith. Wait, wait. There's a tr trick like B6, and then no. trying to <laughs> to win here, but it's not gonna work. Just you can take, and then Rook takes Bishop, and your Rook comes back to defend. Oh, nice try though. If Rook oh. takes this pawn, takes B7. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was clever. Yeah. But now it's. Too much extra material with two minutes remaining. The next game will be our final one. Okay. All right. Well, All right. Here, here it is. Go. Here it is. Here it is. Come on, Teddy. Knight f6 for the well, fans. Depends, depends what Lars plays. One time. All right, Teddy, do it. Oh no! my god, it was so perfect for that. No, it was prime situation. Oh, I'm so disappointed. I'm that's <laughs> what I'm gonna bring up to him first. Oh, <laughs> yeah, forget everything. It's like, where was Knight F6 Rook G8? You choked at the end, man. Oh my gosh. Oh, I'm just so
so upset now after what's in such a fun match to not end on the Rook G8 note. Although, what's with the White's pawn structure now? <laughs> this is pretty ugly with two sets of double pawns. Yeah, and the fact that E5 is not even your square. Like, I can right. play F6 and kick you straight out of there. And then the knight would have to go back to G4. So for now, it's, you know, F6 would be a problem in the E6 square, but it's an idea to kick that piece out for sure. Mm -hmm. It said voluntarily brings the knight back. So if yeah, I gave, it's just sort of avoiding <laughs> trades. If I gave white a few free moves, it goes back to E5. <laughs> well, we did see a game where Teddy moved his rook um, like 25 times in a row. True. <laughs> and we saw the game where Lars was defending, where he went like rook f7, rook d7, queen b8, like queen back right. and forth. So we've had a lot of shuffles. And isn't black just doing so well here? He is, but uh, g4, I was going to say, I expected g4. The funny thing is f6 traps the knight then. Oh, my gosh. You need the square for your knight. It's yeah. Good call. Yeah. This I would have played g4 and blundered my knight there for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it just makes sense. You're taking away the yeah. f5 square from the knight. And Teddy playing some principal chess, queen a5 offering the trade. Your pawn structure is better. Knight to b8. Where's that knight going? I, I would like punch in knight g5 type of stuff and say, look, you can win my knight maybe with f6, but I think it's almost time to sack because look at the invasion on the queen side by Teddy. Yeah, I'm with you. I think that sacrificing was the best chance for white because look at king h1. Your moves are just shuffling back and forth and teddy bringing some more pressure knight to b5 comes to mind to go to the c3 square potentially play mm -hmm. rook c8 and play c5 you don't want to undouble the pawns but you can do so if you gain something and g4 there is g4 though I, I like it i mean if you're going to try something this is the right thing to do and all of a sudden the e pawn and look how quickly the energy is shifted away from the, the queen side right and that's a very smart move rook to e3 protecting this d3 pawn so that you didn't walk into a Oh. lost but knight c3 can you grab the a2 pawn yeah but then then i think maybe f5 and counterplay look at that knight on a2 they're stuck they're stuck your best move would be someone move your first knight and then move your second one out but the knights are trapped here and b5 you said f5 there's knight f5 as well that could be powerful because yeah. the rook is not defended look at that i love that uh idea just Give up the a2 pawn and say, look, your knights are so silly. They do, they support each other, but neither one of them can move. Yeah, it's one of those situations where it's quality rather than quantity. Black is up a pawn, but look at the quality of the pieces. And, oh, my gosh, this king is about to be in a world of hurt. <laughs> look at those two knights. Black king is probably like, wait, don't, don't I have a pair of those somewhere on the board? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, over here, buddy. Um, B4 and a2, not really helping you. Knight takes f6. Yikes. Oh, there's going to be some sort of puzzle rush finish here. Yeah, rookie seven, queen h6. Yep. Okay, queen g5, yeah. queen g8's mate. So now it's not longer mate. Oh, oh my gosh. No. <laughs> it's mate. No. Queen g8's queen g8. mate. Oof. And Teddy is just reacting. Like, all the emotions just, you know, came to fruition there at the end. And both players sigh of relief. Uh, you know, I think both players are relieved that the match is over. They for sure are. We'll hear their thoughts in a few. But Aman, I mean, just to summarize this. In the bullet, it felt like it was about to be a close match. It had been to this point, and Lars ran away with it. So going forward for him, it feels like he has the right recipe to keep winning these matches. Yeah, it looked like Lars basically played the same opening with both colors. That, that is what happened today. He played the Dutch and the, the white Dutch. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so that's all he needed, and he relied on his bullet skills. And at some point, uh, you know, I feel like we were just being treated to the Lars show when he finished with a 10 point differential one of the biggest margins that we've seen in the entire competition well we'll be back in a few we'll hear the players thoughts in the meantime grab some popcorn and we will hear from teddy and lars in just a few
welcome back. Robert and myself are uh, pleased to be joined by the players from today's match. That's Teddy Coleman and Lars Oscar Haug. Um, welcome, guys. And I'll start with you, Teddy. I mean, a roller coaster match. In the end, the score was reflective of a pretty convincing victory by Lars. But is that sort of how the match felt to you? Because from our perspective, there were a lot of really close games. Yeah, I, I um, you know, I think definitely there were a bunch of games that were kind of pretty tight and, and went okay until we hit the time scramble. And then I think, you know, Lars is just way too good at bullet and, and, and playing under pressure. And it felt like nearly every single one broke his way. And so, you know, yeah, congratulations on the win. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun, uh, even though it, you know, didn't quite go my way this time. Yeah, and, and Lars, on your end of things, you were up four to one. And then Teddy won two games in a row. Did that tilt you a little bit? Did you feel a bit nervous? Or what was going through your mind at that point? Uh, yeah, it was a bit unfortunate because at first I thought that like the match was going really well. And then after I lost those two games, like the score is almost even after, after a three-point lead. But like I assumed that I would do better in the bullet section. So I just hoped that I would do like fine in the two blitz sections and then do well in the bullet. And I, I got a lead after the blitz, the blitz part, which was great. Yeah, that's a good, a good strategy. And I guess one that you've been using very effectively in the entire competition. Uh, Teddy, back to you, because there were some insane time scrambles. You touched on them. Uh, I can think of a few off the top of my head where uh, Robert and I were going crazy because you, you blundered like a whole rook. And that the evaluation bar was still in your favor. Uh, there was one game you blundered a whole rook, and you had these pawns and a knight, and we were like just going going nuts. So there are so many games where I felt like you blundered, yet you were still in the game. That's how good your positions were. Yeah, I think that maybe was the first bullet game, and like you know, I played. I think it was rook h two, and he could take, and I was just like, oh my god. Um, yeah. But then I realized like my king, my king was pretty far advanced, and I was like, okay, maybe there's some way, um, but I couldn't, you know. I think again, I, I blundered a little bit later on and couldn't quite hold it together. But um, no, there definitely were chances. I just, I just didn't seem to be able to kind of capitalize on them. Yeah. On the flip side, Lars, you found that stalemate trick at the end of the three-minute portion, which was unbelievable. Yeah. Just recognizing that with no time on your clock. So between yeah. finding these tactical resources, but also, I, we thought you played really well when you would put your pawn from f4 to f5 and close the king side. So was that? part of your match strategy overall, this kind of closed positions that allowed you to go and try to attack? Um, I generally try to get like attacking positions. So I don't really mind if they're open or closed. I, I just want a position where I can attack and play actively. So um, with the F4, F5, I thought it made it easier to attack or at least maneuver for some time and then his king might be weak so at some point. But the generally, the strategy was just to create attacking positions. And right. I didn't really mind if they were open or closed. Yeah, um, I think those, sorry, those positions ahead. are, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, I just think, yeah, those positions are also just very easy for you to play because you just kind of like throw the G pawn, attack my king, and it's like a little bit hard for me to like generate that um, counter punch on the team side. So yeah, I think it was working really well for you. Mm -hmm. The like speaking of F4, F5, I guess, was that a match strategy, Lars, that you were just going to play the Dutch, like no matter what color you got? <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. I've played a lot of birds and a lot of Dutch where I usually go for like this Leningrad uh, positions, but uh, it worked very poorly with black in this match. Like he played this D4 and then like early Bishop G5, which I, I ended up struggling. But I thought I got good positions when I played it with white. Because then yeah, this yeah. early bishop g4 is impossible, or it's not that good at least. Yeah, I had I had prepared this line with f3, which I only got to play once. But uh, you know, objectively speaking, I don't think it's a very good line. But I think it just leads to kind of interesting positions for blitz. But uh, I was hoping to play it again, but you never gave me a chance. Yeah, I I, I hadn't seen it before, and you played it so fast, so I didn't want to repeat. <laughs> well, Teddy, speaking of questionable lines, interesting for blitz. What about knight f6 followed by rook g8? You had the perfect situation in the final game, and you didn't go for it. I know. Well, at that <laughs> point, you know, uh, I know that's your favorite line uh, to try to go d4, knight f6, c4, rook g8. But 
Uh, I saw, you know, in the match against Selena, I think after d4, knight f6, you were playing either bishop g5 or something like that. And then, you know, then I wouldn't be able to play it. So I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I should have. Oh, yeah, so there was upset. mass disappointment in the, uh, in the commentary <laughs> booth. Robert was livid that, that he didn't see rook g8 at the end. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, wow. But that was a, an entertaining match. Uh, Lars, you uh, congratulations. It was a very convincing win in the end uh, in one of the biggest margins we've seen um, in the tournament. And you move on to the next round. And, uh, you know, you, you'll be facing off against, uh, uh, looks like, Roberto Molina. So uh, any, any thoughts on uh, that match upcoming? Have you seen any of his previous matches in this tournament? Yeah, I uh, saw his match versus Lawrence Trent. That was quite an interesting one. Like Trent was ahead at the beginning, I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was match. a very interesting match. So I'll probably have to prepare a bit for the Molina March. Yeah. Seems like you're you seem pretty tired right now. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Do you feel exhausted after playing Blitz and Bullet for three hours? Yeah. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Honest answer. Yeah. Well, we definitely appreciate you both joining us. Lars, congratulations. Teddy, sorry that your terms come to a close, but for the second consecutive year, you made your presence felt, so you should uh, hold your head high. Thanks, Robert. All right, thanks, guys. Yeah, and, thank you. And we will let Lars get off to bed. It's probably pretty late there uh, in Norway, and we see that the bracket is filling itself out. Lars Oscar Haug moves on to face Roberto Molina. So, Aman? Based on what you've seen today, based on what we saw from Roberto against Lawrence, who's the favorite in that matchup? Wow, it's it's a really good question. Um, such contrasting styles. Like, <laughs> there's like maybe not a bigger style clash in the whole tournament. Uh, Roberto Molina, uh, when we were commentating that match, it's like, can I trade these queens off? If so, I'm doing it immediately. And Lars is probably the exact opposite energy. So I'm really excited for that matchup. I think that styles, you know, they say styles make fights. Styles make matches, so I'm I'm really excited for that, and also excited, Robert, to find out our our final, uh, well, our last semifinalist. Yeah, we have the matchup Tuesday night. That is 6 p.m. Pacific time. That's 9 p.m. Eastern. If you're in Europe, you can do a quick little Google search to figure out what time that is for you. But you will not want to miss the matchup on Tuesday. It is international master Levy Rosen, better known as Gotham Chess, taking on I am Rosen. That is Eric Rosen. So, Aman. Our time today for this match is done, but you know, we've had so much fun today. And I, of course, was ribbing Teddy. He is one of my best friends for full disclosure. Teddy and I are super close, and we actually have talked jokingly in the past. I had thought about playing Knight of Six Rook G8, so <laughs> I, I was trying to, you know, pass the torch on to him here. He didn't do yeah. it, but he, uh, you know, he, he played a tough match. Lars did seem like the better player between the two in the blitz. And throughout the whole match, Lars was just digging deep when he was in trouble. And when he had the advantage, it felt like Teddy couldn't find his footing. So I felt maybe 10 points is more than we expected, but it did feel like the match went heavily in Lars' favor, especially down the stretch. Yeah, and he's uh, developing a, a recipe, shall we say, for, for victory because he's used a very similar style. He's, he's using the clock to make up for his bad positions, which is a great strategy in blitz. You're not gonna get a good position every single game you play. That's just not how it works. So he's making sure that when he's in those tough spots, he's playing quickly, and then he's, he's using the clock as a weapon at the end of the game to at least make a comeback. And if you win 20%, 30% of the games that you're lost in, and you convert all the ones that you're ahead in, that kind of feels like that's how this match went today. Yeah, just that stalemate. I'll never forget that one. Oh, the, yeah. The quick queen d5 check, which should be parried by that uh, queen block and winning the game for Teddy. Finding that stalemate with no time on your clock, that's very difficult because our instinct is just keep checking with our queen and do something, yeah. but not give it up for free. So that's of course. A, that was a huge moment in the match because Teddy was trying to uh, decrease his deficit. And all of a sudden, Lars finds the saving move. It probably put Teddy in a bit of frustration and for Lars just throughout I thought he played really really well so he moves on to semifinals and well on behalf of us Aman I've had a pleasure with you it's been great to see so many people here rooting on the players and yeah. they'll have to wait until Tuesday for more from the I'm not GM speeches championship but they can enjoy their Sunday the Super Bowl's ahead you're gonna watch uh, I am going to be watching. Uh, I'm going to probably go and and host a uh, a little you know hype couple hour preview show uh, you know on the Chess for All channel real quick. But then 
you know, I, I do have to end because I can't can't be missing the Super Bowl as a as a North American, Robert. It's just a, it's a must watch. Well, who do you got winning? Uh, it's not about who I got winning; it's who I bet on to win. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I I'm cheering for I'm cheering for Brady and the Bucks. Okay, well, I'm rooting for Mahomes and the Chiefs. So we're maybe partners for this co-commentary gigs, but now we're enemies when it comes to our rooting interest. But Amon, thanks so much again for having this call with me today. And to everybody watching, please have a good rest of your day. Stay safe and be well.